This is an audiobook of Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, edited by John Fisher, published by Lumpanix Unlimited in 1983. This production is covered by a BIPCOT no government license, which allows reuse or modification by anyone except for governments or their agents. Learn more at bipcot.org. This book was originally transcribed by Shane Radliff of Liberty Under Attack in May of 2016. Kyle Reardon of the Alaska Steel blog will read section one, and Shane from LUA will read section two. Enjoy. Introduction. In the early 1960s, a ferment began among some people who were interested in expanding personal freedom and possibly creating a truly free society, one much freer than any that exists at the present time. This ferment, heavily influenced by the writings of Ayn Rand, grew to become the modern libertarian movement. One of the earliest libertarian projects was Free Isles, which was an effort by some Southern California freedom seekers to explore the possibility of founding a libertarian new country, perhaps on an island somewhere. One of the participants in the Free Isles project was a unique man who called himself El Rey, later changed to Rayo. The Free Isles project never got beyond the talking stage. When it petered out, Rayo began looking elsewhere for ways to expand freedom, especially his own personal freedom. He decided that land mobility was a promising idea, so he moved out of his apartment into a camper mounted on a pickup truck. For several years, he lived in his camper and later at campsites deep in the mountains and forests up and down the west coast of North America. During these years, Rayo wrote about his ideas and his way of life in several small newsletters and journals. The following chapters consist of a collection of the best of these articles taken from Innovator, Free Trade, Libertarian Connection, and Vanu Life. Sources Innovator, called Liberal Innovator during its first year, was published from February 1964 to autumn 1969, usually monthly. It was subtitled, Applications, Experiments, and Advanced Developments of Liberty. Innovator is one of the leading libertarian publications of its day, even though its circulation was only about 1,000 at its peak. Free Trade was published in March 1968 to November 1969 as a supplement to Innovator on a varying schedule, usually bi-monthly. It consisted of ads and unedited letters from subscribers discussing freedom ideas and applications. Libertarian Connection began in December 1968, apparently influenced by Free Trade. LC was an open forum publication, which means each subscriber had a contractual right to submit a certain number of pages for each issue, which would be published unedited just as they were submitted. LC was printed on mimeograph machine for the first 45 of its six weekly issues. Then a new method of printing was introduced using photo offset with 50% reduction, very small print. After issue number 79, a new manager, non-editor, took over LC and changed its name to The Connection. TC is still being published as an open forum newsletter on a six-weekly schedule. As of this writing, the latest issue is TC 110, which runs to 92 pages. You can get a sample issue of TC by sending $1 to Erwin S. Strauss, 9850 Fairfax Square, number 232, Fairfax, Virginia, 22031. Rayo published Vanu Life himself beginning in May 1971 until 1973 when he turned it over to another editor who continued it until November 1974. There were 17 regular issues of VL and one larger issue called a special handbook issue, all printed by photo offset with 50% reduction, like the later issues of LCTC. The last few issues of VL were actually called Vanu Link, but I usually refer to them as Vanu Life to indicate that they are part of the same series. The 17 regular issues ran from 4 to 14 pages each. The special handbook issue called Vanu Life 1973 was 32 pages long, about half of it was written by Rayo. Prices since the following chapters were written between 1964 and 1973, the prices mentioned are very much out of date. To help you adjust the prices for the considerable price inflation we have endured since the 1960s and 70s, I have compiled the figures below. The second column of the table below comes from What Would More Inflating Mean to You, published by American Institute for Economic Research. It shows what the purchasing power of the dollar had declined to in various years based on an index of 100 for the dollar in 1939. For example, the dollar is worth 35.9 cents in 1970, which means $1 in 1970 could buy goods that cost only 35.9 cents in 1939. I calculated the third column by dividing each figure in column 2 by the 13.8 cents figure for 1982. This yields a multiplier which can be used to adjust previous year's prices to see roughly what those items cost at present at 1983 prices. 
For example, since a multiplier in column 3 for 1967 is 3.0, an item that cost $100 in 1967 would cost about 3.0 times. Uh, $100 equals $300 in 1983. When prices are mentioned in the following chapters, you can refer back to this table to find the multiplier for the year that chapter was written and adjust those prices to see what their equivalents are in 1983 dollars. Of course, the prices of some items rose more and some rose less over the years, so this will give you only a rough estimate, but perhaps it will be somewhat helpful. Section 1. What does freedom mean? Is freedom a useful concept? Can a social environment be meaningfully described in terms of freedom? Spokesmen for the political economic status quo assert that man is, in large measure, a slave of his environment and his personal limitations, and thus is never really free. This implies that acts or threats of violence inflicted on one man by other men are no more oppressive than are the misfortunes and restrictions inflicted on man by his physical environment. That, for example, a state edict to pay taxes or be imprisoned is not fundamentally different from the biological need to obtain food or starve. If this view were correct, then freedom would be a sociological myth and all arguments for freedom would be empty phrases. A meaningful concept of freedom cannot include immunity from natural phenomena. A man is obviously never free from the principles of gravity, nor free from the necessity of sustaining his own life so long as he chooses to live. What is the significant difference between constraints imposed on a man by other human beings and the requirements of physical reality. Man's physical environment is mechanistic. It is not volitional. Man's ability to function within his environment is limited only by his intelligence and knowledge and by intrinsic physical properties of the environment. Man may choose to increase his knowledge and devise ingenious ways to overcome apparent environmental constraints. And the environment continues to function in a potentially predictable manner, devoid of conscious intent. Man possesses and may use intelligence to alter his environment, but his physical environment has no intelligent purpose to oppose man. In contrast, constraints imposed on a man by other men can be the result of conscious, calculated, volitional intent. Purposeful attempts by a victim of force to regain his freedom can be opposed and negated by the purposeful counteractions of the coercers. Men bent on the forceful imposition of their demands can be a vastly more serious threat, a vastly more severe restriction on human action than are the non-reasoning forces of nature. For this reason, freedom, defined as the absence of physical force initiated by intelligent beings, is a meaningful concept. Freedom is a vital component of human effectiveness and fulfillment. From Liberal Innovator, Volume 1, Number 4, May 1964. How to develop liberty at a profit. Initiated violence by government is the big problem facing humanity. Few libertarians will take issue. But why are efforts to achieve liberty so paltry, amateurish, and inadequate compared to efforts to solve other problems? Why must liberty be marketed so inadequately? Why is so little capital available for the development and sale of liberty? Government, much of it unnecessary and unwarranted, sees directly or indirectly about 40% of our earnings. In contrast, an insignificant fraction of our income is spent for cleaning compounds. 
yet vastly more money is available for promoting new detergents than for all pro-freedom political and educational activities combined. It is therefore not surprising that new detergents are promoted incomparably more effectively. Perhaps a missing ingredient is profit motive. One observes that new detergents are merchandised by profit-seeking corporations, whereas libertarian groups, political and educational, are dependent on philanthropic contributions in fact, if not in name. Unpaid expenditure of time to promote a course or book is as much a philanthropic contribution as is monetary donation. And merely setting up an organization which is legally profit-making is no assurance of realizing profits. Can liberty be developed and marketed for a profit? Or are there crucial differences which vitiate profit potential between liberty and other products? Between the elimination of systematic coercion and, say, the removal of dirt from clothes? Existing governments are invariably natural monopolies within their geographical areas. An increase in freedom, a reduction in government restrictions realized by any means short of armed insurrection, potentially benefits every individual within the nation who does not seek the unearned. The benefits of liberty accrue to the individual whether or not he helps achieve a greater liberty. For example, if a pro-libertarian is elected president and reduces income taxes, misguided persons who bitterly oppose the man, as well as a person who did nothing, will benefit as much as those individuals who donated their time and money to elect the man. Is it surprising that the unspoken slogan of many libertarians becomes, I'm all for greater freedom, provided somebody else does the work necessary to achieve it. Each individual who does participate in a pro-freedom activity certainly will increase the amount of freedom or the rate of increase of freedom at least slightly and will thereby derive at least a small tangible benefit. But the benefits of pro-freedom political or educational activity within a nation are diffuse. The individual within a nation receives as tangible returns only a minutely small fraction of the improvements he brings. Most pro-freedom activity is a charitable donation to unknown strangers. Are they ways for giving political partisans a self-interest in motivation? Yes, but the methods are probably not useful to libertarians. For example, instead of proposing a planned tax reduction program for all citizens, a pro-freedom candidate might propose the elimination of all taxes, but only for those individuals who contribute $100 to his campaign. Such a proposal would probably ensure defeat at the polls. Further, such an idea if it could be implemented, would almost certainly be found unconstitutional. Ironically, the pro-collectivist candidate can, and does, take advantage of short-range self-interest of immoral people by promising legal plunder to special groups and plunder-supported patronage to special individuals. Consequently, pro-freedom Political forces labor under what must at least be called an enormous tactical handicap. What is true for political activity is equally valid for most educational endeavors. Pro-freedom educational activities, of course, offer opportunities for tangible profit to a very few individuals, such as writers, lecturers, and professional staffers who may be able to earn a comfortable living from their enterprises, but who could probably draw a much larger income working, say, in the advertising industry. And, besides, growth of such libertarian endeavors as book selling, lecture circuiting, and institutional educating is, finally, 
vitally dependent on personal contacts by readers, followers, and students, which is largely philanthropic. The sparsity of personal, tangible returns constitutes a severe limitation on conventional political and educational activities, an enormous handicap to almost all existing pro-freedom organizations. The individual must properly live his life for his own sake, and he quite correctly devotes the major part of his life energies to those tasks which yield direct material profits. This does not mean that pro-freedom activities of the conventional sort are necessarily irrational. It does mean that such activities are largely philanthropic, little different in this respect from the Hart Foundation or the American Cancer Society. An individual can rationally participate in a philanthropic enterprise only if he judges his tangible benefits to be greater than his tangible costs. What pro-liberty activists will yield tangible as well as intangible benefits? One potentially profitable category of action is tax minimization. If the individual can reduce the taxes he pays to the government, he not only directly benefits himself, but indirectly furthers liberty by reducing the funds available to the government, funds which the government can use for vote-buying spoils schemes and propaganda in support of its collectivist policies. Unfortunately, the amount of tangible benefits which can be realized through tax minimization is rather limited unless one resorts to illegal evasion of taxes or goes on strike and lives as subsistence levels, either of which may result in disadvantages which nullify tax savings. A category of action similar to tax minimization is anti-inflation investment. Holding savings in forms such as silver coins or stocks, which have a commodity value rather than merely a fiat money value. Besides benefiting oneself, such practices effectively reduce the quantity of government-issued money in circulation and reduce the ability of the government to plunder through the inflation mechanism of debt creation. A promising new approach for developing liberty at a profit is being advanced by various groups who seek to initiate sovereignly independent, laissez-faire free ports outside of the United States. It is proposed that commercial communities be developed on land, sovereignly lease, or purchased from existing nations. The major attraction of a free port would be complete freedom from taxes and regulations. For a great many businesses, the disadvantages of remote location would be far outweighed by the advantages of total freedom. Unlike the utopian community in Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged, Random House, 1957, which symbolized a withdrawal from the existing society, a sovereign free port would be very much a part of world commerce, though not of existing political states. The developers would not attempt to become economically self-sufficient or socially exclusive. Many of the probable industries, in fact, would involve international commerce, industries such as resorts, warehousing, import-export, security exchanges, and marine bunkering. Investors in the initial freeport development would directly realize profits through sale and lease of land. The land would appreciate in value both by virtue of being in a laissez-faire community and as a result of development. For this reason, freeport development outside the United States would attract capital much more readily than can political and educational activities within the United States. The secondary social benefits of a free port would be impressive. Not only would the free port provide a political economic haven for those seeking to establish a business, practice a profession, 
establish a private experimental community or merely life free from state harassment, a free port would provide a valuable demonstration, a living refutation of the myths regarding the semi-capitalism of the 19th century. To advance individual freedom, libertarians must devise unconventional approaches which utilize personal self-interest. The laissez-faire free port is one outstanding way to develop liberty at a profit. From Innovator, Volume 2, November 1964. Some Thoughts on Libertarian Strategy I have followed with interest the debate between political crusaders and self-liberators in libertarian connection and free trade. I make the following comments on terminology. Political crusaders try to categorize all non-crusaders as retreatists. The retreat concept, as set forth by Harry Brown, and Don and Barbara Stevens means disaster insurance, preparations to survive an expected future politico-economic disaster without substantially altering one's pre-disaster lifestyle. This is not the same as self-liberation. A change in lifestyle is not predicated on coming catastrophe. While a retreater and self-liberator may use some of the same techniques, their attitudes and general approaches are different. I am here concerned mainly with self-liberation. Objections of the political crusaders to self-liberation, mostly innuendos, ex cathedra pronouncements, and misrepresentations have been refuted by me, Spring Innovator, page 7 to 47, and others. But the crusaders have consistently failed to refute or even acknowledge serious objections to any would-be libertarian political movement. I'm using political in a broad sense to include all efforts to take over, replace, or destroy an existing state through education, elections, and or insurrections. The two most fundamental problems of any genuinely libertarian political movement are, number one, its dependency on collective incentives and, number two, the dichotomy between means and ends. Strangely, a free enterprise economist who understands that voluntary large-scale collectivism will not work in industry believes it can work in a revolutionary movement. And strangely, a revisionist historian acquainted with many well-intentioned reform movements and revolutions, which brought forth only more tyranny, believes that political activity can bring liberty. Any realistic strategy must be premised on the real world, and explicit libertarians are a very small fraction of the population of that world. Whether this is due solely to cultural conditioning or to genetic inheritance as well, I would not care to guess. But in any case, presently and for the foreseeable future, only a relatively few people will have the intelligence, integrity, and motivation to achieve or preserve freedom. The masses have the minds of serfs, while many do not desire slavery as such. Their attitudes, customs, and reactions constitute a milieu in which coercive governments can arise and will. History provides overwhelming empirical evidence. Holbrook made the point, July Free Trade, that the herd has never been on any side, and that the war will be between the libertarian and the statist vanguards. While correct, this is not very encouraging, for statists have positive, individualizable incentives for enslaving and plundering the herd whereas libertarians can only have negative collective incentives for liberating the herd. Libertarians will almost inevitably lose any such contest as they have throughout history. For results of the American Revolution, read Eriks's 
the decline of American liberalism. So any talk about continent-sized free societies of whatever kind brought about by whatever means is strictly utopian. Such talk may be a pleasant diversion and may help convert the few who have libertarian potential. But in the real world, liberty will be limited for a long time to come to self-liberated individuals and perhaps libertarian mini-cultures and free ports. But this is not the grounds for pessimism or defeatism. One can forget about the herd and become free once he exorcises the collectivist spooks from his head. But while I reject political crusading as a strategy, this does not mean I shun active resistance as a tactic. While seizing or destroying a state, even if possible, is usually worse than useless, selective counterattacks may have value. In many ways, a bureaucratic apparatus is like a simple biological organism. Pavlovian psychology is applicable. Cause a certain behavior, such as molesting a libertarian, to be painful, and an agency will learn not to do it. At first thought, it seems that any conflict between an individual libertarian and a large state is hopelessly one-sided, but this need not be the case so long as the libertarian sticks to self-liberation and doesn't try to beat the statists at their own games. While the state has much greater resources, it is a correspondingly larger target. The libertarian can hide or remain anonymous, striking out a time and a place, and in a manner of his own choosing. The state cannot. Contemporary technology, if anything, favors the individual. Anyone sufficiently determined can build his own nuclear weapon, or more appropriate for libertarians, psychedelic arsenal. The self-liberator has tactical advantages over a would-be insurrectionist of any brand. The political crusader, who wants to take over or destroy a state, seriously threatens the rulers and will bring strong countermeasures. But the libertarian who is satisfied to coexist in protracted conflict with the state is merely an annoyance. The more astute ruler is aware, as is the libertarian, that most people are sheep and will remain sheep, no matter how the libertarian lives. Of course, the statist would still rather squash the libertarian if this were easy. So libertarian tactics must be such as to make counter-counterattacks ineffective and prohibitively costly. One simple retaliatory mechanism is available right now to many libertarians. An individual puts part of his savings in a cash or Swiss account accessible to a friend and makes the following agreement. If he is arrested, so long as he remains incarcerated, his friend each month withdraws a certain sum and spends this for whatever will cause the offending governmental agency maximum annoyance and disability. If the individual should be executed, all of his earmarked savings are so expended. This friend is contractually obliged to carry through the retaliation, even if the victim cannot stop it while incarcerated. This prevents possible intimidation should the agreement be found out. This agreement is presumably kept secret. The agency and the individual bureaucrats would, however, be told for what they were being punished. It would be pointed out their victim was not only minding his own business, but was acting in accordance with clear-cut moral principles that he was not merely a common criminal, one of the herd gone astray. Through such a retaliatory arrangement, the victim not only increases chances for release, but gains a certain satisfaction. So long as he remains in jail, what better use could he make of his savings? Whether or not such retaliation should be limited to legal activities is beyond the scope of this letter. 
libertarians are devising many clever schemes for fouling up the state. But rather than applying these erratically and willy-nilly, I suggest they be reserved for well-defined, limited objectives beneficial to libertarians. As retaliative capabilities grow, libertarians may be able to realize the de facto immunity from conscription, social security, travel regulations, and other especially onerous violations of liberty. Responding to Carl Hess's remark, libertarian connection number six, number one, I would not cooperate with the police in the apprehension of a libertarian revolutionist. Anyone who did would be aiding the initiation of force and would himself become fair game. Number two, I would be happy to shelter any fairly rational libertarian revolutionist fleeing a state agent, and as suggested above, I might be able to offer him a more rewarding employment of his skills. There is another area for mutual interest or alliance, ideological education. The revolutionary seeks recruits and self-liberator seeks associates and underground traders. A specialist in educational services can profitably serve both. A note to fellow self-liberators on this. Now that several good sources of educational services exist, I suggest a boycott of organizations which are knee-jerk hostile to self-liberation. This is not to suggest that educators must themselves opt out or endorse any particular approach, but it is in our self-interest to reserve trade and contributions for groups which, number one, avoid categorical condemnation of self-liberation, and number two, are open to advertisements of self-liberational media and ventures. From Free Trade, a Supplement to Innovator, November 1969. Some Thoughts on Libertarian Strategy, Part 2. Now that a collective movementism, also called bullshit, libertarianism and political crusading, has been discredited as a liberation strategy, it is appropriate to re-examine strategies which treat freedom as an individually achievable way of life and marketable commodity. I discern five general means of protection against coercion, initiated force, defense, deterrence, mobility, deception, and concealment. Any system for achieving, preserving liberty will involve one more of these. Defense. Defense, as a major element of protection, became ineffective with the invention of explosives capable of demolishing castle walls. Large-scale defense became even more ineffective, and the state became obsolete as a protection organization with the invention of nuclear weapons. Some defense means, firearms, karate, guard dogs, chemical, disablements, etc. These are also kinds of deterrence, remain of some value against unorganized predators. Deterrence. A system relying mainly on deterrence tends to be unstable and result in mutual destruction unprofitable to all parties. Its instability stems from the advantages of landing the first blow. One example is the balance of terror among nuclear weapon states, which may break down at any time with catastrophic results. Another more relevant to us might be a band which camps openly, allows their location to become public knowledge in the national forests, and tries to keep the bludgies, pigs, at bay by threatening to burn the woods. This might work for a while, but would result sooner or later, I suspect, in burned forests and imprisoned band members. As black militants have shown, deterrence is valuable, perhaps necessary, but only as a supplement to other protection means. Mobility. 
mobility developed to a logical and useful extreme becomes international mobility or country shopping. International mobility may be implemented by living aboard a yacht or out of a suitcase. Of course, the country shopper does not achieve freedom from the coercive laws of states he visits. He merely maximizes his legal privilege, limiting his activities in each country to what is relatively unmolested there. In one sense, he is more law-abiding than the natives in a port of call since he doesn't know the local territory, law enforcement, practices, and subterfuges as well. Indirect effects of increasing international mobility include, on one hand, a reduction of harassment by some small states which compete for the trade. On the other hand, intimidation of those states by larger powers, mainly the U.S. and the U.S.S.R., intends on keeping their populace subjected. Ultimately, the country shopper's freedom depends on the deterrence defense capability of his ports of call, as well as his ability to move from one to another. Deception. Some libertarians hope to achieve freedom principally through deception. They propose to live conventionally in outward appearance while secretly conducting black gray market trade, designing protection devices useful mainly against unorganized criminals, and enjoying illicit forms of recreation. I have seen many attempted free market enterprises around Los Angeles during the past six years, and, almost without exception, these have failed for lack of interest support or have been co-opted into something subservient to the state. Telephone some successful private protection service and ask for help when you are molested by the big criminals. This lack of interest support, the psychological paralysis afflicting libertarians, of which Natalie Hall has written so well, stems in part, I think, from almost continual vulnerability. Most debilitating is the absence of a secure home or base, mobile and stationary, to which one can retire to relax, eat, think, and recreate. Conventional living libertarians seem even more prone to psychoparalysis than the population at large, no doubt because they are more aware of the dangers. Of course, psychoparalysis is a subconscious evaluation. There need not be a conscious appraisal. One can practice deception 5 or 10% of the time, I think, without long-term ill effects. But the conventionally living libertarian must remain on guard, must act the surf, almost constantly, day and night. Bludgies prefer the witching hours for premeditated arrests. Even if the deceptionist escapes the cruder forms of harassment, he spends his life surrounded by a largely hostile creature, bombarded by value expressions counter to his own. The predictable results are neuroses and or loss of convictions. One tends to become what he pretends to be. How many of the libertarians of even five years ago who stayed in serfdom, are still active, rational, libertarian. Clandestine free market enterprise with the development of specialized skills will greatly enhance liberation. But this will flourish, I think, only among people who have already achieved a large degree of personal liberation. Concealment. Liberation based exclusively on concealment amounts to two-directional isolation, and a complete absence of communication, trade with the outside world, while possible in the short term, would lead to primitivism and probably eventually to breakdown of isolation and increased vulnerability. Suppose, for example, 
that 100 years ago some small band had gone into seclusion, taking with them a good selection of skills, equipment, and reference books of their era. Would their descendants now be capable of understanding and developing counter-stratagems to aircraft spotting, heat detectors, nuclear fallout? Strategy for Personal Freedom An optimally liberated lifestyle must involve a sort of one-directional isolation. The liberator maintains his access to their open but not free trading centers while denying them access to his home. This requires a skillful blend of concealment and deception, plus perhaps elements of mobility and deterrence. A free man obtains information, techniques, key equipment, and supplies out of the servile society, exporting labor or products in return. And during import-export activities, he practices deception, perhaps carries a driver's license, genuine or faked, perhaps pays some sales taxes he cannot conveniently avoid. But the free man's home base is physically concealed. There he spends most of his time. There he may sleep, imbibe, love, design, build trade with fellow freemen, and raise children in relative safety from the savages of state. A free man's home must be a figurative castle. In one sense, such a free man cannot be completely free since his import-export is restricted. Neither would be a resident of a utopian free country who traded with someone in Russia or America. Import-export is easier for ex extraterritorial freemen than for residents of another country, since controlling millions of square miles of interior is vastly more difficult than thousands of linear miles of border. In either case, with growth, import-export becomes relatively smaller and more in the hands of specialists at border crossing. The liberated home free man, unlike the conventionally living libertarian, can segregate import-export from the rest of his life, essential for development of durable, growing, joyous, free mini-cultures. From Libertarian Connection number 14, October 7th, 1970. You're listening to Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radla from Liberty Under Attack Publications and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again, libertyunderattack.com. Now, back to the book. Some Thoughts on Libertarian Strategy, Part 3 What is Freedom? A symptom, and perhaps one of the cause, of psychoparalysis is the vague and evasive meanings given to freedom. Some libertarians consider freedom to be loosely synonymous with opportunity, choice, or capability. This is popular among those who wish to pretend that they are maximizing freedom while they remain very much enslaved. Most residents of the Soviet Union are thus freer than a family pioneering on a remote island. Such a definition merely clouds. It is better to say opportunity when one means opportunity. Others equate freedom with social morality, the non-coercive behavior of others. They assert that freedom can only be bestowed by others, not achieved for oneself. That freedom cannot be achieved in defiance of threats, since the very act of defiance represents a departure from what one's behavior would otherwise be, and is thus unfree. This definition also serves as an alibi for servitude. 
what is a workable concept of freedom? I suggest freedom is in a vulnerability to coercion. Coercion being physical violence initiated by other volitional beings. This definition does not mention threat of coercion. Any psychopath can utter threats against the universe. Threats are taken seriously only when readily implementable, which comes back to vulnerability. Freedom is only one kind of invulnerability. Others include immunity, invulnerability to a species of harmful microorganisms, invulnerability to harmful weather. One who continues in a vulnerable lifestyle and then complains when he is plundered is somewhat like a West Indies resident who builds a flimsy house and then blames the next hurricane for demolishing it. Certainly, people are to blame when they inflict coercion, but merely blaming them does not bring liberty. The self-responsible person builds a home which can withstand likely storms and develops a way of life not vulnerable to likely attempts at predation. No one claims that freedom is a summum bonum. Uh, note the highest good introduced by Cicero. To achieve freedom, one has to forego some opportunities and satisfactions while gaining others. How much freedom? As Lee and Skye mentioned, freedom is not a monolithic entity. There are various degrees, but not all degrees are necessarily viable. For most people, I suspect that choice is between predominantly servile, vulnerable lifestyles and predominantly liberated, invulnerable lifestyles. If satisfaction could be plotted with respect to freedom for a large number of people, I think the graph would have a low peak of relative satisfaction around 5-10% to freedom a higher peak around 90 to 95 percent freedom, and a wide depression in between. The lower maximum is exemplified in contemporary society by many a successful middle American. He lives conventionally, but takes advantage of some of the easier, more obvious loopholes. He pays income taxes, but hires a tax accountant to maximize deductions. He registers for the draft, but goes to college in hope of being made a technician instead of a target. His mental state is one of controlled schizophrenia. He believes most of the statist myths in which he was indoctrinated, yet maintains a modicum of skepticism. He goes to church, or at least accepts their standard of morality, but is not above having a drink at a nude bar. He is largely rational in his work, but keeps his rationality compartmented. He does not, dares not, critically examine his life as a whole. Although self-maintained schizophrenia leads to unhealthy and unhappy complications, on the whole, the opportunistic serf may have it better than is more consistent more gullible, less self-motivated brother who is drafted and becomes a target, and a paraplegic rotting in a VA hospital, struggling along in a low-paying, high-tax job with a load of installment debts. But the opportunistic serf is probably also more contented than the nonconformist, who tried to be free in some things while remained servile in overall living pattern. One who is half free and half serf dwells in a psychological no man's land. He knows too much and thinks too independently to play servile status games with conviction and success, yet remains too immersed in and influenced by that culture to achieve success, satisfaction on his own terms. This includes many, not all, bohemians, adventurers, black market entrepreneurs, 
religious cultural minorities, and radicals of all sorts. A half-and-half -half lifestyle tends to be unstable. Some go on to more complete liberation. Some drift back into, at first, outward conformity, then acceptance of servile norms. Some end in psychosis or early death. The higher maximum of satisfaction is attained by someone with a liberated home-based plus some import-export with the servile society. For him, contact with the state is an occasional annoyance and danger, not a big part of his life. Thus, he can avoid the psychological paralysis that afflicts so many nonconformists. Compared to the opportunistic serf, he may enjoy somewhat fewer conveniences at present, but is happier overall. On the other hand, he has more than someone living in the primitive isolation presently required for 100% freedom. Liberty or servitude or neurosis. Whether one will be happier as a free man or as a slave partly depends on the individual. But this choice is not open to most libertarians. Relative contentment in servitude is possible only for those who believe in it. Most libertarians are too independent and well-informed. For libertarians, the choice is between freedom and neurosis. What become of those libertarians of five years ago who gave up or never tried achieving personal liberty? Of people I knew, one is now a Catholic. Another is a Mormon. Another committed himself to a mental hospital. Many are occupied with chronic ailments. Freedom for what? That is up to you, as Lee and Skye suggested. But in the immediate future, I think most liberationists will include freedom to pioneer in freedom, i.e. freedom to make a career of liberation. At present, there are no ways of self-liberation which are both easy and highly effective. Opt-out will become easier as more do it and develop techniques, but right now, effective liberation requires so much of one's time and resources that one who does it will probably make it his main career, eventually developing services for sale. Liberation is a many splendored thing. There are various ways to do it and a variety of physical and mental activities involved. Liberation draws on a wide range of skills and offers many satisfactions. To some, opting out evokes images of gathering berries in a far off wilderness. Liberation does seem to be easier in uninhabited areas at least is a do-it-yourself thing, which it necessarily is for the first pioneers. But it is also possible in large cities. Imagine, for example, an old expensive building, which appears to be only a private club, but which conceals an entranceway to apartments and workshops tunneled underneath. Freedom does indeed need more full-time professionals, not collective movement preachers seeking a coterie of followers, but explorers, inventors, developers of liberated lifeways. From Libertarian Connection number 15, November 17th, 1970. Thoughts on Freedom Strategy, Part 4, Revised Freedom Terminology In Strategy Part 3, I defined freedom as invulnerability to coercion, but this definition goes contrary to traditional usage. Funk and Wagnall's Standard College Dictionary 68 gives the clearest definitions and differentiations I have seen. F quote, freedom, liberty, and license refer to the right or opportunity to do as one pleases. Freedom is the widest term 
suggesting complete absence of restraint. Liberty is a measure of freedom within restraints granted by or as through by a sovereign power. License is an exemption from restraint granted to one person but not to another. Close quote. Apparently no English word exists for vulnerability to coercion. Sovereignty comes close, but it is usually applied to states and implies not merely self-defense capability, but power over others. This is not surprising since the very concept of invulnerability to coercion of individuals and non-coercive groups is relatively new, at least in European cultures. The traditional attitude is, rule or be ruled, there are no alternatives. Roberta and Tom of Preform have suggested VANU, which is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. VANU is phonetically distinctive. The closest words in major languages are the German von of about, the French vont travel via, and Spanish bono, bond script voucher, none of which means conflict. Forms of vanu and the corresponding forms of liberty and freedom are the condition of invulnerability to coercion is vanu. The condition of the general exemption from coercion is liberty. The condition of the absence of coercion is freedom. The action of achieving the invulnerability to coercion is vanu. The action of achieving the general exemption from coercion is liberate. And the action of achieving the absence of coercion is free. The quality of invulnerability to coercion is vanu. The quality of the general exemption from coercion is liberated. The quality of the absence of coercion is free. The comparatively more invulnerability to coercion is vanu er. The comparatively more absence of coercion is freer. The process of achieving the invulnerability to coercion is vanuens. The process of achieving the general exemption from coercion is liberation. The process of achieving the absence of coercion is freeing. One who has the invulnerability to coercion is a vanuan. The one who has the absence of coercion is a free man. One who advocates the invulnerability to coercion is a vanuist. One who advocates the general exemption from coercion is a libertarian. The advocacy of the invulnerability to coercion is vanuism. The advocacy of the general exemption from coercion is libertarianism. The place or situation of the invulnerability to coercion is vanuum. The place or situation of the absence of coercion is a freehold. The art of achieving the invulnerability to coercion is vanumi. And uh, one who is skilled at the invulnerability to coercion is a vanumer. And finally, one who is skilled at the general exemption from coercion is a liberator. Of course, for all of these, there are degrees. Freedom is usually a relative absence of coercion or of the effects of coercion. Rarely is there no possibility of coercion. Coercion means physical attack, initiated force, against a volitional being or against his non-coercively acquired possessions by another volitional being. Vanu or liberty. Vanu and liberty intergrade, as do almost all concepts in the humanities. 
someone who builds his own impregnable island, is achieving Vanu. But what about his tenant who subcontracts protection? Perhaps the tenant is considered Vanu as long as he remains able to pick and choose, maintains a high degree of mobility. But if he becomes quite dependent for protection, he only enjoys liberty with respect to his protector, although Vanu with respect to outsiders. How about someone working as an independent contractor rather than as an employee in America to avoid tax withholding? Superficially, he seems to depend on legal loopholes, liberty. But tax withholding from independent contractors would be difficult to enforce, so he enjoys Vanu too. Two confidants who trade in secret are clearly Vanu. On the other hand, employment with a nonprofit corporation, which presently is required to collect social insecurity taxes, is only a use of liberty. Is liberty undesirable? Liberty depends on laws and their interpretations, and so is easily destroyed. Vanu, while not necessarily illegal, depends on reality, not legality, and so is more durable. Vanu and liberty interact in various ways. Achievement of Vanu tends to increase liberty also. For example, the unenforceability of alcohol prohibition was a major incentive for its repeal. Vanu also fosters other Vanu. For instance, with the development of a relatively invulnerable home base, Vanuum, one has more capability and confidence to engage in black market trade. Large-scale use of liberty, on the other hand, tends to reduce liberty. For example, the many men who remained in college to avoid conscription prompted circumscribing of college exemptions. A large degree of liberty, long continued, reduces Vanu. In the 30s, the American government was able to confiscate much of the gold, mainly because of its long tradition of comparative liberty and relatively stable currency. Most American residents trusted it and were unprepared to protect themselves from it. Similar confiscations in other countries were not as successful, and American Indians were ill-prepared to defend themselves against the highly organized forms of coercion introduced from Europe. I suspect that any kind of liberated society is inherently unstable. In the general absence of institutionalized coercion, people will lose self-protection capabilities and become very vulnerable to institutionalized coercion, providing fertile ground for growth of new and, for a while, especially vicious states. I doubt that products and services for protection against unorganized coercers would prevent this. A good mousetrap will not stop even a small bear, nor will immunity to smallpox keep one from getting rabies. In a sense, states may be necessary evils, necessary not to provide highways, mail delivery, or other real services, but to stimulate development maintenance of anti-state protection capabilities. A state can be truly limited only by Vanu, its inability to impose servitude and collect taxes beyond a certain amount, not by liberty, such as constitutional checks or a permissive king. A state which doesn't plunder as much as is possible within its social technological environment, or which doesn't use the plunder effectively to perpetuate its power, will tend to be replaced through political evolution, revolution, or foreign conquest by one which does. This is one of the reasons why political crusades to repeal coercive laws or have them ruled unconstitutional are a waste of effort or worse. 
This is a gloomy evaluation only for those who seek to evade responsibility for their own freedom. I am optimistic about prospects for increasing VANU. VANU is yours for the making. From VANU Life Number 1, May 1971, which is a revised version of the original that appeared in Libertarian Connection Number 17, February 10th, 19. 71. Some Thoughts on Freedom Strategy, Part 5. Freedom Through Wealth? Some have said that the best way to achieve personal freedom is to first become wealthy. Here are some contrary points. Someone pursuing wealth tends to get caught up in associated status games and neglect his real objective psychological paralysis sets in. Of freedom seekers I have known who try to get rich, most have not been successful, perhaps because they know too much to play the games with the same dedication and intensity as do the middle American strivers. The few wealthy libertarians of who I know first became wealthy, then libertarian. One is more apt to be successful, and perhaps even get rich, doing something he enjoys doing, which he can do without contradicting his values, than he is doing supposedly high-income activities which he doesn't enjoy. There are formidable and increasing hazards to preserving large wealth once earned. Access to Swiss banks largely depends on government-controlled mails, telecommunication, and air transport. Cacheting large amounts of silver is arduous and time-consuming. $50,000 buys a ton of it. Also, the value of precious metals partly depends on industrial uses, and industry may not continue at present levels. Personally consumable supplies, such as food staples, are the best form of saving but storage and rotation of more than a few thousand dollars worth is formidable. At present, there is relatively little VANU to be purchased. It's mostly do-it-yourself. Most high-income professions are narrowly specialized, dependent upon an economy of tens of millions of people. But only a relatively few people, thousands at most, are apt to vanu themselves in the foreseeable future. The demand in a small market is for broad skills. Most of the relatively free people in North America today have relatively low incomes. Hippies, hobos, some Indians, some blacks. Historically, Jews have been more successful than gypsies at surviving and maintaining heterodox cultures, despite their greater emphasis on wealth. For what it's worth, gypsies have enjoyed better public relations. The emerging Vanu mini-cultures will probably be more tribal than capitalistic in form. Invulnerability precludes large open markets. There are already millions of people striving for wealth by non-VANU means. So let us develop VANU techniques and products to sell them. Personal experience. I have only moderate savings. I'm not wealthy by most standards. By my achievement of VANU has been limited much more by time and personal skills than by money. There are many products and services which I could and would purchase if they were available. They aren't. Of course, someone already into a skill or business whereby they can earn much money easily may well be advised to keep at it for a few years and build a nest egg. But for most Vanuists, I don't think wealth is worth much effort. From Vanu Life Number 2, July 1971. Thoughts on Freedom Strategy Vanu Activity Trade-Off Occasionally, especially when some project isn't going too well, I ask myself, 
can G and I achieve enough Vanu for Vanu to be attractive on more than an experimental basis? Or have we reached a point of diminishing returns beyond which a vast effort will yield only a small improvement? To conceptualize this better, I made the following graph. The vertical axis represents Vanu expressed in terms of mean time to harassment, MTH. Each vertical unit is approximately a 10 times increase in MTH. The horizontal axis represents amount of activity, also difficulty of concealment. The units are summer survival, tent and bedding sufficient for sleeping, eating, and reading. Occupants are one or two able-bodied adults. The occupants hole up, eat only stored food. The occupants come and go not oftener than once a season. Several months supply of food is on hand. All weather survival. Shelter adequate for survival, not always comfortable nor convenient the year round. Maintenance and trips are during good weather. Only sedentary activities and minimal housekeeping are done during cold, wet weather. A several year supply of food is on hand. There is no foraging. Occupants are able-bodied adults who come and go not oftener than four times a year. Comfortable home. Size and amenities are comparable to a small apartment or motor home. There is one small family which may include small children or a non-able-bodied person. The people come and go not oftener than once a month. There is some foraging, hunting, and grow holes but they live mostly on stores. They have no export products except possibly writing or art. Small workshop or laboratory. 400 square foot floor space. Electric power from water, sun, or wind. And or considerable crypto culture. Frequency of communication to outside at least weekly. Transportation at least monthly. Export products may include research development, Fabrication of small special purpose devices, one family, perhaps large, per site. Small manufacturing of items with high value to weight ratios. Aggregate floor space is 1,500 square feet, maybe several separate units. Communication with outside comparable to telephone, telefax. Transportation, at least weekly. Considerable export and or purchases of most food. More than one family involved, perhaps two dozen people. Light industry, many products possible. Also, heavy fabrication for local use. Daily transportation. Extensive outside commerce. Up to several hundred people. Heavy industry and or communication commerce center. Up to 40,000 people. Narrator's note. The graph from the book is included in the downloadable PDF. There is nothing immutable about this clustering of activities. Thus, someone with only summer survival might have a clandestine radio link comparable to a telephone, while a group capable of manufacturing might still import almost all food. But I have attempted to cluster together activities which seem to be comparably difficult to conceal with each unit representing a 10 times increase in difficulty of concealment. Thus, a camp and supplies sufficient for summer survival can be easily hidden, whereas concealing a heavy industry, such as a conventional steel mill, would be extraordinarily difficult. Other levels of activity are intermediate in difficulty and concealment. Within the shaded area, Vanu is not likely worthwhile, i.e., the total cost of being Vanu will usually exceed the total benefits. The boundary between the viable and non-viable situations slopes downwards to the left, at least under present conditions. This is because, number one, the lower levels of activity require much less equipment and thus a higher probability of confiscation is acceptable. 
Number two, the lower levels of activity are less suspicious and thus unlikely to lead to serious loss, even if discovered. Thus, a Vanuan with only a summer camp will not look or act much differently than someone on vacation and is unlikely to arouse suspicion if discovered. At most, he will be ordered to move, whereas a factory found deep in the woods or otherwise hidden will almost certainly be the subject of an intense investigation. Even if the operators elude capture, the equipment will most likely be confiscated. Almost certainly the factory will no longer be able to operate. If three years are the estimated time to amortize the initial cost of a factory, typical, the factory would not be built if estimated MTH is less than that. Exceptions involve illegal products with no non-VANU competitors such as drugs and with a very high profit margin and a correspondingly short time to amortize equipment costs. The diagonal lines represent levels of capability one order of magnitude uh, 10 times apart. Six years ago, when I was becoming seriously interested in VANU but had little experience, my competence was roughly represented by line A. Three years ago, after experience with living in a van, competence had increased to line B. Today, our competence level is approximated by C. Thus, at present, we can choose among the following. A small tent, adequate for summer only, in a remote place with 100 years MTH, a larger tent and more equipment and supplies in a place with year-round access and a 10-year MTH, the larger tent is also more visible. When we want a home with amenities comparable to a city apartment, we must move back to the van and the best we have been able to do with it is one or two year MTH. If I needed a year around workshop right now, I'd have to rent space in a conventional building somewhere. Choosing a good situation and taking responsible care, chances are I could operate for a month before some bludgy came around and asked to see my licenses, etc. With our present capability, line C, we really aren't able to enjoy a comfortable home the year around and be VANU. The price of living in a van is some submission to the bludgies, maintaining a driver's license, paying attention to the legalities of parking in a particular area, etc. With the van, we are, in large part, enjoying liberty, legal interstices, not VANU and laws and their interpretations often change. So long as we have sea level capability, we can trade off between increasing VANU and increasing activity, but increasing both requires more capability. Sea level VANU is attractive, except in a disaster survival situation, only to experimenters in VANU, pioneers, who are interested in VANU for its own sake. We are somewhat analogous to experimenters with aircraft before 1910. These people built and flew aircraft, or tried to, not to get somewhere faster, trains were faster than the first experimental planes, nor even for aerial observation, balloons were more reliable, but simply to fly. Of course, they anticipated future uses, but these would be profitable only after considerable experimentation and improvements. Someone would have been ill-advised to build a plane in 1910 in order to, at that time, travel more quickly between LA and New York. Similarly, our present capability at VANU has limited usefulness. Most people prefer a comfortable home that is relatively non-VANU to Spartan survival with relative VANU. We probably would too, except that, number one, we believe we can increase our capabilities as we gain experience to where we enjoy VANU and comfort year-round. Number two, 
experimenting with Vanu is, for us, an adventure, fun. A minimum of D-level capability is necessary for Vanu to be attractive to many people other than experimenters. E-level is probably minimum for development of much of an alternative economy worthy of the name. How easily, quickly, can we increase our capability by another order of magnitude or two? It is tempting to project past progress and assume we will keep advancing one level every three years. On the other hand, we might be at a point of diminishing returns. My present expectations are that G and I can progress to level D primarily by refining present techniques, living mostly above ground and importing most supplies. Progressing beyond D will probably require fully underground shelters and new access techniques. I'm more optimistic now, March 1973, than when I wrote this, November 1972. At midwinter, our Plinu structure was doing well, and I've conceptualized lifestyles which ease interface problems. Of course, during the past six years, we've made plenty of mistakes which slowed us down. There was no one we knew of to teach us, so there was much trial and error. Today, we could probably guide an inexperienced but highly motivated person, what I was six years ago, to our present level in a year or less. But we aren't especially interested in doing so until we reach level D. Level C is not attractive enough to justify a recruiting training effort. Vonoists disagree about whether one should first see greater activity or greater MTH. Some believe that the neophyte should first try to build up a large and profitable but non-Vanu conventional business, then attempt to Vanu it. Evidence is inconclusive, but I believe the opposite approach is much more promising. Become Vanu at a relatively low level of activity, then attempt to increase activity while maintaining or increasing Vanu. Points. The more people involved and the more interactions with that society, the more difficult any change of lifestyle. A non-Vanu enterprise is apt to have little in common with a Vanu enterprise. Experience gained during the former will probably not be particularly helpful when doing the latter. Concealment is not the only means of being Vanu. There is also deterrence and mobility. But someone who employs deterrence without concealment is essentially just a would-be rival state. Mobility is valuable only in conjunction with some kind of concealment or deception. If one can be easily traced and identified wherever he goes, nothing is gained by moving. To some, deception, concealment, seems so difficult or unpleasant that they opt instead for liberance, playing legal interstices, while remaining otherwise conventional and visible. For myself, I'm not especially interested in liberance, partially because millions of people are already playing those games for all they are worth. I don't believe I could come up with gimmicks much better than what thousands of tax lawyers, accountants, draft advisors, etc. are doing. And legal interstices are transitory. As quickly as many people discover a dodge, the bludgies move in to close it. Of course, a particular Vanu way may not offer permanent security either. There will be new detection and counter-detection techniques. But once Vanuans get below the noise level of environmental change caused by animals, weather, and or non-Vanuans, the bludgies and their detectives will be at the point of diminishing returns. In the short term, certain forms of liberance have their attractions and are worth using. But I believe Vanu has great long-range potential. From Vanu Life, number 12, May 1973.
You're listening to Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radla from Liberty Under Attack Publications and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again, libertyunderattack.com. Now, back to the book. Thoughts on Freedom Strategy, Utopias. This is partly in response to the ongoing debate between advocates of limited government and anarcho-capitalism. Both limited government libertarians, LG, and anarcho-capitalists, AC, believe in deus ex machina. Note. This means God from the machine, which will keep their idealized open market capitalism pure. For LG, the deus ex machina is a constitutional government which has powerful military police forces to discourage foreign and domestic aggressors, yet which somehow abstains from harassing the peaceful. For the AC, the deus ex machina consists of various protection agencies and insurance companies, which remain peacefully competitive and cooperative on the whole, rather than fighting each other, forcing people to do business with them, staking out territories, and becoming states. Both hypothetical systems are contrary to historical experience. Power corrupts sooner or later. State functionaries do what they can physically get away with, regardless of what is written into a constitution. A constitution can be amended, suspended, reinterpreted, or simply ignored. And on the rare occasions when sovereignly independent military forces have occupied the same territory, the result was not competition in protection but civil war terminating in one or more territorial states. Many AC seem to believe in word magic. If independent forces are called protection agencies and insurance companies, they will somehow abstain from doing the dastardly things which states will do. How insurance companies, for example, behave in that society as organizations subordinate to the state is not necessarily how they would develop, if independent of the state. Achieving freedom and preserving freedom are really the same thing. States can be thought of as bad protection agencies, or whatever. But most LG and AC try to separate the problem of achieving utopia from that of preserving utopia once achieved. Few LG are seriously running for legislatures other than for publicity or testing the constitutionality of laws. Even fewer AC are attempting to organize protection agencies capable of defying existing states. Instead, to achieve their utopias, both LG and AC invoke another higher order deus ex machina a cultural revolution, a fundamental change in the world views, ethical values, political attitudes of most people. Certainly popular attitudes can and do change, and can and do affect political systems. But LG and AC err in thinking of popular attitudes as something independent of and antecedent to a political economic system. A person's world of views depend in large part on the opportunities and problems he perceives for himself so long as he feels subject to the state and powerless to change it. He will rationalize that the state is really necessary if not good and will reject out of hand arguments to the contrary. I have come to question not only the LG and AC approaches to the problem of institutionalized coercion, but their ideal as well. Open market capitalism, 
which is not what is commonly called capitalism in that society. Even if pure open market capitalism were achieved through some fortuitous circumstances, I believe it would be hopelessly vulnerable both to outside enemies and inside power seekers. U.S. economic and political history from about 1880 through 1910 comes close to being an example of the decay of capitalism by internal forces. Reference, Colco's The Triumph of Conservatism. During that period, there was considerable economic freedom and consequently relatively little stability of wealth. From shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations was typical. Large, long-established companies were often cut down in a few years by newer, smaller, more capable competitors. There were no safe investments in which Playboy heirs could multiply their wealth while concentrating on high society games. The old rich watched in dismay as new rich, still with lower class, manners and speech, enjoyed the trappings of wealth. It is no accident that many socialists were the no longer very wealthy offspring of wealthy families. And it is no accident that many large industrialists were instrumental in obtaining government regulation of their industries. The supposed purpose of the regulation was to protect the public from big business, and this served to co-op most of the reformers of that era into supporting the legislation. But the actual result of regulatory laws was to protect established companies from new competition. There already existed a central government for the capitalists to manipulate and expand. But some large companies also hire private thugs to harass competitors and unions. If there hadn't been a state, it is difficult to believe that these forces would not have evolved into states. Given pre-industrial technology, especially the communication and transportation, which existed at the beginning of the capitalist era, open market enterprise, even to the limited extent it was able to develop under state controls, was probably the most efficient way of producing marketing things. Given the vastly different capabilities today, I wonder if this is still true. Comparing problems of open, publicly displayed market and vanu clandestine market. An open market is subject to state restrictions and taxes, if any, whereas a VANU market can largely avoid them. On the other hand, an open market can advertise openly, produce in large quantity, and sell through a relatively few middlemen, whereas VANU marketing must be by word of mouth and requires either decentralized small-scale production, or many middlemen. In the recent past, VANU marketing has been limited mostly to products and services which, number one, can only be produced locally on a small scale, such as lawn mowing, auto repairing, hair cutting, or, number two, are illegal. Products for which both approaches are competitive indicate the comparative costs of open and VANU marketing at a given time and place, for example, alcoholic beverages. In the future, I expect more and more automatization of word-of-mouth communication and middlemen functions, greatly increasing speed and security at reducing costs. The newer electronic technology, integrated circuits, is greatly reducing the time, cost of coding, and interpreting data. It is also increasing the ability of snoopers to snoop and correlate their findings, but not in proportion. For example, a relatively small cheap device can encipher data beyond the ability of any conceivable computer to break in a thousand years, or even to identify as a cipher. 
and soon there will be inexpensive radio systems capable of re relaying data in ways not traceable by 100 FCCs. Here is how one such system might operate. To buy or sell something, I type or speak an inquiry, order or offer into my Secure Communicator, SC. My SC enciphers my message and transmits it to SCs of a few individuals I know and trust, which in turn they automatically re-encipher and relay it in microseconds to SCs of people they trust, etc. In this way, my message can quickly reach the SCs of a very large number of people. Someone who is selling what I'm buying has keyed his SC to watch for messages concerning that product. When my message reaches it, it deciphers and notifies its owner. He and I then converse, almost as easily as by telephone telefax, but without having any idea who or where the other person is. At this time, we may change our cipher so that our message is no longer intelligible to intermediate SCs which relay it. We come to terms and arrange delivery. If it is a physical product, delivery may be made through a drop, but most products will be information in one form or another and can be delivered through the SC net. An example might be a program for my automatic micro shaper, which enables it to machine a replacement part for our home flour mill, or even parts for a newer, more capable automatic micro shaper. While a dishonest or unreliable person might join an SC net, he could endanger only his immediate contacts who made the mistake of trusting him. Anyone who used the net to defraud could be cut out of it. Furthermore, his immediate communicants would for a time be considered less reliable. My SC could automatically compute the reliability of intermediaries through which a message comes, as well as selecting alternate routes. Proprietary data, such as a program for my hypothetical automatic microshaper, might be protected from plagiarism by putting individual variations of non-critical dimensions in each part. Payment would most likely be in credits transmitted through the net to an underground bank. Secure communicators and many other VANU products activities will be developed and used only to the degree that people acquire secure shelter of one form or another either through outright concealment or by clever deception. SCs can be declared illegal, just as armored cars, firearm silencers, and gold have been. All known abodes and places of business will be subject to inspection, just as they are now. And if an unidentified or unauthorized piece of equipment is found, the bludgie will likely presume that it's contraband unless the occupant proves otherwise. Such laws will be difficult to enforce. SCs can be hidden or disguised, just as gold sometimes is now. But the few violators who are caught will be publicized, and most of those who lack VANU shelter will be sufficiently intimidated to abstain from using gold or secure communicators. So VANU shelter is a crucial prerequisite for substantial VANU trade. From VANU Life number 13, July 1973. Editor's Note. Ownership of gold bullion by U.S. citizens was illegal when this article was written. A case for non-coercion based on rational self-interest. The ethical principle of non-coercion can be stated. One should not initiate the use of force against a volitional being or against property created or acquired through voluntary consent. Many people espouse this principle, 
but most arguments for it are mystical or altruistic. Some are blatantly so. They invoke God's will, or the good of society as a whole. Others are more subtly so, and talk about natural law, or innate rights, without clearly defining those terms. Some supposedly egoistic arguments for non-coercivism are merely reformulations of Kant's categorical imperative and thus mystical. One example, if I deny inviolate rights of all others, I cannot claim such rights for myself. A critic might respond, my recognition of inviolate rights of all others will predictably have only negligible effects on what rights, if any, all others consider inviolate, assuming no god who enforces uniform rights. Another example. I don't initiate force because I'd rather live in a world where most people don't. A critic might respond, I too would prefer such a world, but I have no reason to believe that my conduct will significantly affect the conduct of the world's population. To base non-coercion on rational self-interest, what must I show? Only that I can expect overall benefits from adopting it, i.e. from espousing, internalizing, and habitually acting in accordance with it. I need not prove that coercion would never be in my self-interest. My decision to embrace or reject an ethical principle is not the same as my decision on action in a particular situation, although the former may decisively affect the latter. An ethical principle is only an abstraction, and like any abstraction, only approximates what it represents. Someone's conception of A is not A. A map is not the territory but maps and other abstractions are often useful. In rare situations, initiated force may be in one's self-interest, and holding a non-coercive ethic, internalized as a habitual response, will mean loss. But this doesn't prove that adopting the ethic was irrational. Any principle is adopted prior to the situation. The probability of overall benefit or loss, judged at the time of adoption, is what is significant. Similarly, in some automobile accidents, one is more apt to survive, if not encumbered with a safety belt. But this doesn't prove that habitually fastening safety belts is a mistake. Overall probabilities of survival, non-injury, are what count. Most critics of non-coercion ethics espouse situation egoism, which is, hold no general principles except this one. Always act according to self-interest as perceived in the situation at hand. Such a critic might say, Why encumber yourself with principles? Why build spooks in your head? Why not play it by ear? In reply, at any time, I can consciously consider only a very small part of what is around me. I must deal with most of my environment through habit and emotion. So the development of generally appropriate habits is to my advantage. If I can walk over ordinary ground without deliberating about each step, I can better think about what is around. An ethical principle, when internalized, becomes habits and attitudes. So the central question of this article reduces to, is developing non-coercive habits and attitudes in my rational self-interest? Consider the alternative, situation egoism. As each situation arises, will I have time to deliberate? To the contrary, most opportunities to coerce are fleeting and require split-second decisions. Zeraini and Strykon gave two examples. Number one, you are one of the two astronauts in a spacecraft returning to Earth. Suddenly, you discover that oxygen leaked out. Only enough remains for one man. Number two, you are alone and see a big wad of bills lying beside an unconscious form in a dark alley. If one hesitates, 
In the first situation, the other astronaut may strike first or barricade himself. In the second situation, the drunk may regain consciousness or someone else may come. In both situations, one is apt to benefit from coercion of one acts quickly, without deliberation. But even those examples involve many considerations. In the spacecraft, more oxygen might be generated by electrolysis of water, or the men can spend periods in drug-induced coma to reduce oxygen consumption. Even if no alternative to death is immediately apparent, a solution may be found with further thought. Might it not be wiser to chance this, or even to join in some cheat-proof form of Russian roulette, than to face possible revenge by the other man's friends and relatives back on Earth, as well as possible destruction of a craft in a flight? In the second situation, is the drunk still unconscious? Is it a drunk? Might someone be watching from an unseen window? Might it be a trap? perhaps sent by non-coercivists to profitably punish or eradicate coercivists. Karate training emphasizes development of appropriate habitual responses. A combatant who tries to think through each move is soon disabled. Similarly, someone who hopes to gain from coercion must not only reject principles, he must train himself to spot opportunities and act quickly, else he miss or bungle them. This is one cost of coercion to the coercer. Time, effort, attention, which could otherwise be devoted to other pursuits. A second obvious cost is risk of defense or retribution by the victim or his friends or agents. A third cost to the coercer is ostracism. He is not likely to develop close, long-term relationships with people he finds desirable. Even other coercivists would rather associate between crimes with those who are habitually non-coercive. Even if a coercivist is never caught, even if he never actually commits coercion, but gives subliminal clues to his attitude and habits through gestures, expressions, inflections, mannerisms, and false starts. He may claim to be non-coercive, but in vain. Others will be uneasy when around him and will prefer to avoid him, although they may not always know why. How serious a loss this is depends on his lifestyle and goals. If he prefers to drift around the fringes of big cities, forsaking close friendships, his loss may not be great. But achieving freedom will be very difficult. Freedom through wilderness vanu, international mobility, urban hideaways and or black marketeering is enhanced by close, trustworthy confederates. Many freedom achievers are especially sensitive to subliminal indications of attitudes and habits because their freedom in part depends on spotting spies and other security risks they especially are likely to shun a situation egoist. How big a reward might be offered for information? How much could he rip off? Will he be tempted? Etc. Conceivably, a coercivist might become such a good actor. His friends would never catch on, but this entails the greatest cost of all. He must constantly suppress inhibit, fake, and live in fear of a slip giving him away. I doubt that he can do this and retain a deep capacity for joy, and without it, his successful rip-offs will be hollow triumphs. Could a band of coercivists avoid these problems by agreeing not to coerce each other, only outsiders? This is often attempted. Every state is such an attempt. But without a general principle of some kind, any agreement is without basis. Some will turn on others the first time they perceive an advantage. And this possibility leads to distrust and sometimes preemptive strikes. I do not claim that adopting non-coercive ethics is in the self-interest of everyone, but I conclude 
that for myself at least, and probably for those who seek to control their own lives, non-coercivism -coercive will maximize efficiency, probable safety, trade opportunities, and emotional capacity. Narrator's note, the footnotes and endnotes will be in the PDF. From Invictus, December 1972. Editor's note, Invictus is no longer being published. End of section one. You're listening to Vanu, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radla from Liberty Under Attack Publications and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again, libertyunderattack.com. Now, back to the book. Section 2. Practice. Self-seeking. Free aisles. How can you increase your freedom? This is the theme of self-seeking, a continuing and formal exploration of various ways for realizing greater personal opportunity in the present world. The range of interest of self-seeking is the lifespan of its readers. Self-seeking is looking for approaches to freedom that will yield results within a few decades at most and which will directly benefit the liberators. Likewise, self-seeking examines ways for living more efficaciously in society, as it is. To bring about general political economic liberty is a formidable task. Most political philosophers have concluded that a radical change in popular moral attitudes must occur before freedom can prevail. Ayn Rand aptly summarized this in For the New Intellectual, Random House, New York, 1961, quote, The world crisis of today is a moral crisis, and nothing less than a moral revolution can resolve it, end quote. But even the more optimistic prognosticators do not foresee significant economic political fruits of a cultural revolution in this century. More pessimistic forecasts. Taking into account the probability of further massive government intervention and control over education and communications, if not overt censorship, place results centuries away. Long-range cultural revolution activities are not, of course, to be deprecated merely because they will not bring freedom in our lifetime. Not only can an individual gain personal satisfaction by helping a revolution on its way, but a career in the education or communications field may bring tangible profits as well. The college professor in the humanities, the popular novelist, the writer of children's books, the advertising executive, each receives remuneration for his work. When making career decisions, the individual is, of course, primarily concerned not with the benefits that a cultural revolution will bring to everyone sometime in the dim and distant future, but with the benefits he will personally gain as a result of his work. And the course of action that is in the long-term self-interest of the individual is not necessarily the most effective for hastening development of new social customs. As an example, an acquaintance who recently graduated from college is potentially interested in and qualified for teaching high school literature, an excellent profession for constructively influencing developing minds. She has, however, chosen a position as a technical writer with an engineering concern, a position that offers much less opportunity to bring others to a rational, libertarian point of view. Decisive personal considerations were ease of obtaining the position, higher pay, and greater personal freedom. Are there ways to bring about a cultural revolution much more quickly than have been thought possible, say within a decade or two? The above example suggests that some mechanism for enabling individuals to realize an immediate tangible return from converting others would be a potent catalyst. Attempting to vastly accelerate constructive cultural change is one general approach to freedom in our time. Another is the creation of localized areas of liberty in an otherwise unfree world. I have heard four different approaches proposed for creating islands of relative freedom. One of these is the sovereign free ports, another is the intentional community. Described in March 1965 Innovator, Preform's Free Isle would be a sovereignly independent commercial free ports, literally a small new nation. While a free isle would be initially formed by and substantially directed by libertarians, it would be open to anyone who chose to come. The most ambitious scheme for a local area of freedom so far proposed, a sovereign free port, would potentially have much to offer. The free isle resident would hypothetically have all of the advantages of participating in world commerce while being free from taxes and regulations. Furthermore, a free isle, if it were successful, could be a very effective demonstration of the merits of laissez-faire capitalism. 
With such advantages go sizable difficulties. Acquiring land for a sovereignly independent free isle requires a special treaty with a source nation. A very substantial amount of capital would probably be required to interest the government of even a small, underdeveloped country in parting with some of its own territory. And the reaction of other governments to such a venture poses potential hazards. Preform now fears that economic isolationism by the U.S. and other states, if it comes, will annul much of the economic potential for a free isle. The intentional community is a smaller and more limited approach based on physical congregation of libertarians in a geographical area. The essential difference between an intentional community and a sovereign free port is admissions requirements. The intentional community would be smaller, less involved in external trade, not possess legal sovereignty, and require less capital. The intentional community approach appeals to individuals who foresee an impending political economic collapse and or would like to try their hand at self-sufficient living. To others, it might be of value as a vacation spot or as a bedroom community where they could raise children away from any of the irrational influences prevalent in a philosophically mixed society. From Innovator, Volume 2, April 1965. Self-Seeking, Green Revolution Quote, Ron and Laura became part of the Green Revolution. The Green Revolution moves opposite to the Red Revolution, not bloody and violence, but quietly, via persuasion and education. Not through government and the state, but through personal and family action. Wherever individuals, agencies, and institutions, in Russia or elsewhere, distort and dominate the purposes and activities of other individuals, there the Red Revolution is active. Wherever individuals decide and implement their own purposes, they are part of the Green Revolution. End quote. Thus, Mildred J. Loomis introduced Go Ahead and Live, an interesting potpourri of essentially libertarian views, information, and ideas for realizing greater personal freedom through independence from the cash and tax cycle of state interference and expropriation. In essence, Go Ahead and Live is the story of a young couple seeking a way to truly live of their rejection of the coercive status quo and their search for a more rewarding way of life. With the story as a backdrop and unifying theme, Contributing authors present essays on diverse subjects, self-sufficient living, home building, nutrition, child raising, education, sexual mores, and economics. To self-seekers, go ahead and live as perhaps most interesting as an account of individuals who have tried self-sufficient living. It describes several modern homesteads, ranging from a four-acre garden plot to a 160-acre farm and one intentional community of 20 selected families. All of these are within the United States. Quote, how much land constitutes a homestead? It varies with how self-sustaining you want to be, Mildred Loomis explains. Perhaps you want only to supplement your city job, then an acre or two is all you need. Just enough to grow your vegetables and fruit and possibly a few animals. Does this sound simple and insignificant? It isn't. What can bear some stressing is the relative freedom from exploitation on a homestead. You could keep your cash income below a taxable level and still live very comfortably, end quote. Martha Treichler adds, quote, It is not the size of the plot that determines what we call homesteading. It is the emphasis, the values, and the patterns of living you want to implement. We agree that there are many political economic errors in our society. We want very much to help correct them, and we do associate with groups and efforts moving in that direction. But in the meantime, we must live. We choose to beat the cost of living by producing more and more of our own. We do not do this because it is economically efficient, but because we enjoy it. Growing, storing, and processing food, weaving, sewing, and repairing clothes, making furnishings and furniture, creating our own arts and recreation, all of these are fun, creative, enjoyable, and satisfying, end quote. Go ahead and live abounds with specific suggestions such as, quote, start gardening with a small plot you can spade by hand. You can even start by smothering weeds and sod by covering it with a heavy mulch or compost pile for a season. Or pin a pig on the plot and let him root out the sod. Develop a vermin-proof storage room, or barrels, for corn, wheat, shell beans, sunflower seeds, and garden seeds. A cool, dry basement, or a cave dug into the side of a hill, or a pit dug in, in the earth and covered heavily with straw, will winter store potatoes, cabbage, carrots, beets, and celery, end quote. Ken Kern gives some advice on how to build your own home and describes a house he constructed with a cash outlay of only $2,950. Don Werkheiser asks, what is a libertarian community? He explains, one in which members are co consciously and quite consistently self-regulative or non-authoritarian, end quote. A fictional community is described which is modeled after May Valley Co-op at Renton, Washington, about 10 miles from Seattle. A dozen families formed an association, pooled their capital, and bought a 45-acre farm. Twenty half-acre home sites were plotted. The remaining land, including woods and pasture, was retained by the association. The home sites were leased only to families approved by the association. Fee for a 99-year lease was about $1,000. 
20 families was considered optimum, large enough for efficient specialization of labor, yet small enough to minimize costs of roads and water and to enable all families to know each other well. The total sharing community, such as Robert Owen's New Harmony and other disastrous experiments with voluntary communism during the 19th century, is discussed and gently but firmly rejected. There is, quote, the need for persons to individualize their interests rather than combine them. Persons who share goals can cooperate for certain specific purposes. This is voluntary association, and with it goes the right to disassociate, end quote. Go Ahead and Live also includes some perceptive passages on education. Quote, Something is radically wrong with education, and I think the error is authoritarianism. The state is coercive, and most educators are doctrinaires. They differ only on what is to be indoctrinated. None are libertarians. Much less do they believe that liberty and education is possible or would work. With rare exceptions, educators have been apologists, adapters, and rationalizers of the particular status quo in which they lived and operated. If we had liberty and education, if parents felt free to set up their own schools or teach children at home, we would have a condition where the best would win. People would choose which schools to send their children to. There would be a choice between different opinions about how and what to teach. This involves competition and education." End quote. Go ahead and live is not without faults, the more salient. While a rational view of existence is implicit in almost all of the sections, there is not an explicit integrated philosophy, a serious deficiency in a book that would offer an integrated approach to living encompassing all essential facets of human existence. A theory of interest is propounded which ignores rate of future discounts. It detracts from discussions on economics. The organic versus chemical farming dichotomy is entertained. Some of the dietary recommendations seems to be based on a mystique of nature rather than a rational analysis of the actual merits of various food growing processing methods. One contributing author apparently regards love to be a cause rather than an effect of excellence. Contemporary mixed American fascism socialism is referred to as modern finance capitalism, an unfortunate choice of terminology. Despite flaws such as these, I highly recommend Go Ahead and Live as a source of useful information for anyone who contemplates independent living. Go Ahead and Live also contains an extensive bibliography of value as they lead to other sources. The School of Living, Brookville, Ohio, which authored the book, was founded by author Ralph Borzotti about 30 years ago. It is an information education center for homesteaders and do-it-yourself individualists of all varieties. Go Ahead and Live, published by Philosophical Library, Incorporated, New York, 1965, is available from School of Living, Brookville, Ohio, for $4. From Innovator, May 1965, Volume 2. Editor's Note. The present price and availability of Go Ahead and Live is unknown. To adjust the prices mentioned above for inflation, see the introduction. Self-seeking, take over a state. Two basic approaches have been previously outlined for creating localized areas of freedom, a sovereign freeport and the intentional community. A third alternative might be called a local congregation. A correspondent in Illinois who prefers to not, to not be identified suggests, quote, a state could be taken over. By everyone moving to one state, a concentration of effort and voice could be obtained. A state like Oregon would be ideal. A low population, varied topography and climate, a coastal state for shipping, etc. There would still be federal laws, though unless freedom was so well sold that the state might try secession, end quote. He adds that such an undertaking should be executed without fanfare to avoid giving rise to conspiracy theories within the state. I would add that such an endeavor, by its very nature, might best be executed informally, as the net summation of many independent decisions by individuals. Central planning or direction would be prohibited by the number of people involved. A local congregation may be either inside or outside, for example, to a locality within America or to a foreign country. Possible objectives of a local congregation. Achieve a complete laissez-faire society. Secure a base for educational efforts. Acquire local political control, though not independence. Facilitate economic trade and information exchange. Since most taxation and coercive interference with commerce is inflicted by the federal government, substantial freedom could not be achieved through an inside migration, excluding secession. But educational benefits might be considerable. The statewide elimination of socialized school would end one massive source of collectivist indoctrination, greatly increasing the number of people receptive to libertarian ideas. And a few rational libertarian congressmen could use publicity accessible to them for presenting rational ideas. What state is the most promising terminus of an inside migration? The subscriber in Illinois presents the case for a small state, Oregon. I will offer an opposing view. In a large metropolitan center, although each individual has less influence on the state, a greater diversity of jobs exists, enabling more persons to come without economic sacrifice. Furthermore, the large cities are disproportionately larger culture centers, offering long-range educational advantages. For example, most network TV shows and mass circulation magazines originate in Los Angeles and New York. 
My specific choice would be Southern California, primarily because this area already has the largest libertarian population, perhaps a quarter or more of all of the libertarians in the world. Unlike the Northeast or Middle West, a substantial part of the population is strongly pro-freedom. More important, most rightists in California are substantially rational and favor liberty not only in economics, but in personal activities as well. For example, at least one conservative Republican congressional candidate has campaigned for complete freedom of speech and press, expressing opposition to laws against obscenity, a stand which would be political suicide in most parts of America. What about moving outside of the United States? Not for the purpose of starting a brand new community, as Preform has suggested, but with the intent of locating and eventually becoming a dominant influence within some small existing nation. How quickly could, say, 1,000 libertarian activists alter a small English-speaking nation of 200,000 population? A few promising spots in the world are being studied with this in mind. What location do you recommend? What are its merits? From Innovator, June 1965, Volume 2. Self-Seeking, Ethical Enclave, Black Markets What is an ethical enclave? An ethical enclave is defined here as voluntary transactions between individuals who are living under a collectivist government when such transactions are conducted independent of that government. Ethical denotes the distinguishing characteristic of the participating individuals. It adheres to the ethical principle of voluntarism, the principle that no one should initiate violence or threat of violence against another. And enclave denotes physical immersion within a philosophically alien society. An ethical enclave is not necessarily a separate geographical entity. An ethical enclave by existing within the territorial domain of a course of government is either legal, utilizing interstices in the taxes and regulations of that government, or illegal, operating despite threats of violence. A simple example of an ethical enclave trade. A doctor seeks an architectural design for his new office, and the architect needs medical treatments. If either reports the transaction as inco income to government agencies, both are liable for heavy taxes, so they agree to exchange services and confidence, thereby realizing substantial savings. The actual trade may be conducted either as barter or in terms of a medium of exchange. An ethical conclave may have similarities to traditional black markets, but the differences are significant. The mixed-premise black market operator, while violating socialist laws, still holds, at least subconsciously, some of the premises embodied in laws. He may experience a depressing sense of guilt. He may act with the handicap of psychological conflicts. The enclave entrepreneur, however, disavows not only the particular instance of initiated violence, but the collectivist morality as well. He experiences an exhilarating sense of righteousness. He acts with the confidence and certitude of psychological consistency. The enclave entrepreneur, furthermore, is dealing not only with immoral, by their own definition, criminals, but with producers, with moral individuals who are committed on principle to hold confidences and honor contracts. His costs of doing business, therefore, tend to be less. An ethical enclave potentially embraces many more products than black markets, which deal only in illegal goods and services. In a nation where taxes and regulations are oppressive, a profit potential exists for trading in legal goods and services as well. Ethical enclave trading profits participating individuals and promotes liberty in general by reducing the plunder available to the collectivist government. Plunder which would most probably be, probably be used to finance further violations of liberty, plus propaganda to rationalize the violations. The potential effect of ethical enclave trading should not be underestimated. Mixed socialist governments direct most of their extortions and regulations at trade. They tax primarily income and sales, but a transaction can easily be taxed only with the cooperation of at least one party to the transaction. Large-scale non-cooperation would render income and sales taxes ineffective and greatly reduce government revenues, an ultimate check on a state's capability for violence against its subjects. An ethical enclave would also encourage growth of a libertarian movement by adding self-interest motivations. Today, many an individual who is implicitly pro-freedom is discouraged from gaining the knowledge necessary to become explicitly libertarian because personally profitable applications of such knowledge are so few. So long as the principal profits to be realized from promoting liberty are exceedingly long-range and indirect, few of even the most enthusiastic individuals remain active for any length of time. Persons with a little less initial self-esteem simply reject an ethical view which they sense as impractical, adopting instead the maxim, you can't fight city hall, which often becomes rationalized in time to, maybe the system is not really so bad. By offering opportunities for immediate personal profit, by rewarding libertarians for their intellectual honesty and perseverance, a thriving ethical enclave could be unheralded but nevertheless substantial attraction for individuals of ability. How might an ethical enclave operate? What is its potential in the present context? What are its problems and their possible solutions? To what extent do informal ethical enclaves already exist? What is the relative merit of an ethical enclave compared to other approaches to freedom in our time? From Innovator, November 1965. Self-Seeking, 
International C-Mobile. How can you realize the most personal freedom right now? Become internationally mobile. Stop being a captive audience for the real-life black comedies of a particular gang of clowns turned goons and begin m making real market choices between states. While no existing nation offers all-around liberty, many contain useful interstices. So the free man of the world, like the alert shopper who buys the specials at various stores, selects the best features of various states. And his very high mobility gives added protection from the worst depredations. Elaborating. In most of the states of North and Central America, except the United States, the visitor is little molested so long as he remains economically uninvolved, so long as he only consumes, spends money he has earned elsewhere, and does not produce for the local market, secure employment, or enter business. In the United States, on the other hand, one cannot live well, be it to establish a home, raise children, or confidently engage in any long-range endeavor. But by virtue of the comparative prosperity which yet remains due largely to past freedoms, one can still earn with relative ease. This suggests one mode of mobility. Become an international commuter who maintains a home in the Caribbean and makes occasional forays into the U.S. to obtain spending money. A person with a skill can earn enough in a couple of months to live modestly but comfortably elsewhere for a year. International commuting is especially advantageous for the free marketeer who applies in his occupation the principles he holds. By minimizing both time spent and possessions kept in his country of business, the place where he is most vulnerable, he enhances security of self and home. Of course, he avoids most of the taxes from his country of residence simply and legally by not selling his services there. While the economic benefits are significant, perhaps the greatest value of home away from work is psychological. Safety within the grave society depends on conformity and anonymity. One must avoid overt expressions of individuality. Take pains to blend with the gray multitude. But self-esteem seeks outlet and celebration, and the fruit of one's labors are best enjoyed far from the eyes of interested tax thieves and other people molesters. However, in the long range, a fixed residence is unsafe anywhere. The coercive state, a maelstrom of violent interference, is inherently unstable. The relatively placid banana republic of today may be a nasty little despotism in a few years. So the far-sighted global gypsy seeks not only physical separation of work and home, but mobility of home as well. One excellent way to combine the advantages of permanent residence with mobility is by making home aboard a boat. With the development of molded fiberglass hulls and synthetic fiber rigging and sails, yachts are becoming less expensive and easier to maintain, already comparing not too unfavorably with land-based dwellings of the same size. As more libertarians take to the water, some will doubtless anchor and migrate more or less together as a semi-permanent, water-borne community, saving time and money through the exchange of services. Internal free trade not subject to the scrutiny of any state. The Voluntary Floating Association has some advantages over the free hamlet in the hills. Not only will anchors be lowered where state interference is minimal, the very mobility discourages intervention. For instance, state school officials seldom molest the children of transients. Another blessing for parents. The irrationalist, coercivist influence of outside peer groups and mass communication media is considerably reduced. Differences of objective and conflicts of personality, which may disrupt an immobile and intentional community, are easily resolved. The dissenters weigh anchor. And a community can develop by easy steps and without formal direction. No would-be founder need acquire a large tract of land, uncertain as to market demand or the response of the state. The floating voluntary society begins with a population of one. The mobile libertarian not only bypasses most existing state coercion, but is well equipped to escape ins incipient totalitarianism. With the American government readying plans for general forced labor, rationing and censorship in the event of a war or other national emergency, escape can be essential for philosophical if not physical survival. And while a retreat in the boondocks can serve as a temporary hideout, when total fascist socialism comes, those who fare best are usually those who leave early. While international mobility is a way to increase personal freedom, precisely for this reason it becomes an effective strategy for societal liberation. The mobile liberta libertarian is actively not just potentially in the market for liberty, and any growing market tends to attract caterers. As more seekers of freedom cease their Sisyphean labors of reforming particular governments and or living with coercion and become country shoppers, a few many state rulers may begin to compete for their trade. How can you increase your mobility? Learn more about foreign lands and oceans. Study the literature. Learn to sail. Learn a second language. Spend vacations traveling abroad. Be mobile in occupation. Avoid professions which require long-term fixed resident or extreme specialization. Consider instead jobs involving travel, the ocean, and or boats. The fishermen or charter boat operator is already afloat and knowledgeable of the sea. Independent intellectual activities. Many writers, artists, inventors, and researchers do their work almost anywhere. 
temporary skilled employment, the job shopping engineer, designer, or technician not only commands a higher wage rate than his permanently employed counterpart, but can be gone for months or years between jobs. Migrant labor. Harvest workers can not only earn relatively high wages on a piecework basis, but can usually arrange to take their pay in produce, which they may resell, avoiding taxes. Service to other seamobiles. As floating communities grow, medical, educational, and repair skills will be in demand. If you are already established in a business which precludes extensive travel, economize, maximize short-term income, and save toward financial independence. Secure your savings. Choose investments which need little supervision and which are safe from state interference. Internationally diversify while funds are still easily removed from the U.S. Limit possessions to what you can move, discard, or cache. For housing, choose a yacht over a house, or if you prefer to live on dry land, rent. For land transportation, use a motorcycle and a jalopy, or rented vehicles. Base your self-esteem on extraterritorial pursuits. If your present occupation depends on the coerced society, avoid ego involvement. Develop active interests which can accompany you wherever you go. Take delight in a panorama of new places, not the minutia of a particular locale. Seek friends who are going your way. Cultivate long-term relations with libertarians having similar aspirations, potential neighbors in a future floating society. Get a passport, but don't depend on it. Passports may be revoked in the event of a national emergency. Live at peace in a place of refuge. If you wish to battle a state through political agitation or overt civil disobedience, fight where you know the territory. In your native land or a country picked with that in mind. But when you seek a haven from the storm, quietly comply with or bypass local laws. If your state of anchorage becomes intolerable, don't waste energy in extended public criticism or conflict. Apply your free market principles by setting sail for sunnier waters. Footnotes. 1. Of course, coercion directed against production is the main cause of underdevelopment, but this need not be a con primary concern of the perpetual visitor who intends to remain uninvolved with the local state. 2. Several acquaintances have recommended trim trimarins for oceans living. Trimarins provide more interior space per cost, faster cruising, less heel, and easier beaching, important in unsettled areas, than comparable monoholes. Report reportedly, a 35-foot lodestar, which has the living space of a small apartment, can be purchased fully equipped in Taiwan for about $8,000. Sale away prices in the Orient are little more than one half of U.S. prices. Of course, the import duty must be avoided, possibly through foreign registration, to realize the full saving. 3. See Ocean Freedom, a newsletter notebook forum on libertarian marine ventures published through Agoric Communications. Also see the Permanent Floating Voluntary Society series by Carrie Thornley, July through December 1966, Innovator. 4. In the Floating Voluntary Society, physical mobility may provide an effective defense against coercers, dom domestic or foreign. Imagine the frustration of some obnoxious would-be mayor who awakens one morning to find that most of his city has left during the night, or the chagrin of the naval commander who steams to the attack, only to be confronted by empty ocean as, a, as myriad small craft and floating structures scatter in every direction. A state, which is basically an institution for seizing fixed property, including mineral resources of the ocean floor, will be relatively incapable of inflicting injury in a society where people and most property are highly mobile. 5. Looking ahead. As ocean dwellers proliferate, entrepreneurs will locate floating breakwaters outside of territorial waters and start f floating free cities. The lure of laissez-faire attracting at first tourist business and later an increasing diversity of industry and commerce. 6. To appreciate the difficulties of, of long-term survival in the fully developed slave state, read The Diary of a Young Girl and Frank and Dr. Zivago. Of course, domestic fascism will probably be accompanied by more coercive isolationism, exchange controls, and travel restrictions as rulers try to shift the consequences of their past interventions to innocent subjects. But if, when, an American Iron Curtain is erected, I prefer to be on the outside looking in. 7. With the large number of newly emerging many states throughout the world, why has no country yet come close to true freedom? Well, a rationalist coercivist mass indoctrination, plunder schemes of indigenous state officials, and American foreign aid programs deserve much of the blame, the decisive factor has probably been little appreciation for real liberty by those most in the market. Businessmen dealing in international commerce. Significantly, specific freedoms which have been in substantial demand, such as free banking, low-cost registration, and duty-free transshipping have attracted vendors. From Innovator, March 1967. Editor's Notes. Regarding Note 2. Trimarans also have offsetting disadvantages, and heated discussions have taken place in sailing circles among proponents of tries versus monos. Although typical recent prices of trimarans are not available, adjusting the price of $8,000 in 1967 for inflation would give a price of about $24,000 by 1982. Monoholes, of course, will have increased in price similarly. 
Regarding Note 3, Ocean Freedom, Ocean Living was published from March 1967 to October 1970. The first three issues were called Ocean Freedom, then the name was changed to Ocean Living. And all 12 issues are published. Back issues are no longer available. Letter from a Nomad I am living in Big Tahunga Canyon. Bright sunlight and fresh air stream into my home. A hundred yards away rushes the creek. Beyond rise rugged hills, green with winter grass and budding shrubs. A few more days I will live here, riding, installing some equipment. Then move to Los Angeles for a short, intense contract job. Next summer, when Tahunga Canyon is no longer very green and Los Angeles may be hot in more ways than one, I will be living somewhere in Canada. My home is a house car. I choose this way to freedom because it offers me the best of two worlds. I can live most of the time away from regimented, congested, indefensible cities, yet still profit by exporting my labor into these cities. I have the freedom and security offered by mobility, yet I possess what is in most respects a permanent residence. I can fully enjoy my life right now, yet live economically and accumulate capital for further ventures. Finally, I can opt out alone. While I look forward to trade with others who may choose similar or complementary ways of life, my liberty does not depend on their decisions. I am also delighted with unforeseen fringe benefits, ease of washing or resting after a journey, no worry about what to take with me, no time spent idle waiting for something or someone, no commuting to work. All travel is more efficient. I move only from destination to destination without intervening trips to a stationary home. Far from having a primitive way of life, I enjoy electric lights, running hot and cold water, shower, gas range, and heater. And all are self-contained, not dependent on external utility connections. With occasional refills of water, gasoline, and propane, I can enjoy my modern conveniences anywhere a rugged truck will take me. At first I was crowded, especially when my rolling voluntary society doubled in population. But after consigning seldom used items to storage, adding under chassis compartments, and carefully rearranging, the interior is neat, belongings are accessible, and space is adequate for two people. Like many other self-liberating activities, mobile living is safest in the largest city or wildest wilderness. Cops have bothered me only twice in four months of living aboard. Both times were in farming areas where, while traveling, I had stopped on unposted private lands. Patrolling deputies asked me to move on. I have no problem parking on city streets at night, usually in apartment residential areas. On jobs, I often stay in the company parking lots. Only rarely have I rented space, the backyards of friends, when doing work which immobilizes the truck for several days. This way of life is very economical. My almost new house car, including much gear I have added, has cost under $6,000, a fraction of the price of a comparable yacht or a well-equipped retreat home, not to mention a cracker box in the suburbs. And living expenses for two total about $120 per month, including $55 for food, $20 for gasoline, $10 for maintenance, $10 rental for storage base, and $25 for miscellaneous. So far, I've been too busy to travel extensively or to seek out especially attractive campsites, but already I have lived many exquisite days and evenings at beaches, mountains, and forests. I am still learning the way of a modern nomad, but already I am free. From Innovator, March 1968. Editor's note, see the introduction to adjust the prices mentioned above for inflation. Choosing a van for living aboard. During the past five years, two of us have lived in a motor vehicle three quarters of the time and in various tents one quarter of the time. The following are based on our experience and that of personal acquaintances. Don't expect high volume in a van. Have acceptable ID. A four-wheeled vehicle needs makes trails and so is difficult to hide well. We have really tried, yet even in our most secluded squat spots, we get hassled, asked impertinent questions once every couple of years or so. Nevertheless, a camper or van may be ideal for someone in transition out of that society. Ours has served us well that way. Don't plan to travel much unless you have plenty of money. Don't buy a cheap, well-worn van to move across the continent in unless you are already a fairly skilled mechanic. Overall cost per mile of a one-ton vehicle will be about double those of a small imported automobile. Single-piece vehicles, vans and motorhomes, and pickup campers both have their advantages. A van is lighter, sturdier, has a lower center of gravity, and is less wind-resistant. Campers are mass-produced and often cost less for the same comforts, may be more flexible, and cheaper to license in some states. Buy instead of build unless you are already experienced. The money you save building your own camper or making major changes in a van will be a very low return on your time. The experience gained is not very useful except for building more campers. If you do build, don't expect to achieve the overall quality of a factory built until your second one. Have at least a one-ton vehicle, at least 9,000 pounds gross vehicle weight, maybe one and one-half or two-ton. But check out the idiosyncrasies of the extorters in the states you expect to license and drive in. 
In many states, vehicles over one ton rating are supposed to stop at way stations and have commercial plates. Have plenty of traction and a very low speed bottom gear for getting off the road. Four-wheel drive is often desirable, though expensive. Next best is dual rear wheel wheels with most of the weight on them. VW microbuses and most three-speed standard transmission vehicles don't have a low enough low gear. Avoid vehicles much longer than a big car, 20 feet, and trailers if you will go into cities or off the road much. Two small vans are more expensive than one big bus, but handier. Also beware of campers with long, low overhang. Furnishings recommended for living aboard most of the time. Good insulation, furnace with exhaust and vented to outside. I like a propane floor furnace with pilot for quickness of heat, simplicity and no smoke. A very small and light wood stove would be nice for backup. Good ventilation, screens on all openings, cooking stove, probably propane, at least two burners, sink draining to wastewater can, which can be removed for emptying, five gallon water with spigot, which can be set over sink for use, taken down for filling and when moving, proper lamp, or possibly a laden kerosene lamp, for main light with 12 volt bulbs for quick light and backup, dual batteries, dual propane tanks, polyurethane foam pad for mattress, light fairly cheap, doesn't mildew. Blackout shades or drapes over all windows. Plenty of cabinets, closets, drawers, and work surfaces. Ideally, most bulky furnishings, cabinets, sinks, tables, etc., are firmly mounted yet easily removed for use of vehicle for hauling. This I haven't seen in factory builds. Furnishings not recommended. Any appliances such as refrigerator or air conditioner which use 120 volt electricity in quantities too large to be supplied by an inverter. John Hard mounted on the vehicle. If a flush toilet is wanted, get Porta Potty or a similar make, which is a portable, self contained unit and can be removed for emptying. Vehicle mounted water system. We have one, but leave it drained much of the year so we don't have to worry about freeze up. Shower and hot water heater. Again, we have one, but find we'd usually rather jump in a creek, even in January, or take a sponge bath than spend a half hour moving impedimentia from the shower, filling the tank, turning on the heater, etc. Unvented heater. Fumes are harmful. Minimize windows in a van if it will be in a city much. I'd consider a skylight, but not a bubble top unless it was somehow retractable. Squatting and permission parking both have their advantages and drawbacks. If squatting, one pays no rent, and one has a greater choice of spots including more secluded locations and so is less frequently hassled. Parking with permission, one spends less time finding spots and is less likely to move when hassled, which can be important if one is in the middle of a major overhaul. Permission parking doesn't offer greater security. Bludge insists on access to all trails, and Bludge usually first ask for ID. We have permission to park here. You can check with our landlord. Isn't a sufficient answer. Squatting for up to two weeks, sometimes longer, is legal on all lands and not otherwise posted. Chances of being prosecuted for trespassing are practically zero, so long as there is no littering, open fires, or vandalism. Few landowners wish to provoke people. Too easy to set grudge fires. After several years' experience, we find we squat about 80% of the time, permission park about 20% of the time. From Vanu Life 73, March 1973, page 37. Further report on shelter. Dr. Gatherer and I are living in an A-tent made by placing polyethylene film 20 feet wide over a rope strung between two trees. Our tent is 9 feet wide, 7 to 8 feet high in the middle, and 35 feet long. This is the first time we have had ample Vani workspace sheltered from the rain and snow. One change we have made from our previous A tents is to leave the ends open, which results in less underside condensation, no drips. We plan to fabricate triangular sections from scavenged cloth, which will cover the ends under the poly to stop breezes and allow some solar heating. Another change, bracing poles, two pairs are also placed in an A shape, which leaves an unencumbered walkway down the middle. Cost of the poly plus rope was about $15. Near one end of the A-tent lays our newest creation in which I lie typing this. We call it a foam hut. It's about 9 feet long by 4 feet wide and 2 feet high, tapering toward the foot end. It is made of 2-inch polyurethane foam glued together with a special cement, which may be 3M77. Uh, the can which was purchased at Hills and Grants Pass is unlabeled. In one side of the hut is the door covered by a flap of 1-inch foam to which rocks are tied at the bottom to keep it snug. And the other side is a window covered inside and out with a transparent vinyl type plastic. The foam itself would probably pass enough light now, but foam darkens with age. In the roof at the head end is a screened hole for extra ventilation when our kerosene lamp is lit or in warm weather. A piece of foam plugs the hole when not needed. The foam alone, open cell, provides sufficient ventilation for breathing. The hut is sort of like a giant sleeping bag except that the domed roof is firm enough to hold position. Under the floor, extending from shoulders to knees when sleeping, is an extra 3x4.5 foot piece of 2 inch foam for comfort and additional insulation. 
Based on the few temperature readings so far, the hut provides about 20 degrees Fahrenheit above outside temperature with one person inside, 35 degrees for two. This is the body heat alone. When the lamp is burning, we must open the door. The coldest morning so far. Outside temperature was 20 degrees, inside 57 degrees. We were comfortable nude under three blankets. The foam hut is a big step forward for us in comfort with Vanu. Until now, when tent camping in winter, we could be comfortable huddled in a sleeping bag doing nothing but reading on one hand, or doing strenuous physical work on the other. But how does one typewrite, sew, or repair machinery, work requiring bare hands, and below freezing temperatures? Keeping a stove going for heat means much extra work and less Vanu. Incidentally, this issue of VL is the first one typed and pasted up in a tent. Until now, we have done it in our van. The foam hut is also a boon for Dr. Gatherer's sprout farm. A tray of glass jars keeping warm with me in the head end. Sprouts grow poorly, or not at all, during cold weather, if just a tent. The hut weighs about 20 pounds and rolls up into a bulky but backpackable bundle. So far it survived, undamaged, one trip from our van to our base camp. About four 45-inch by 76-inch sheets of 2-inch foam went into the construction. Material cost about $50. Fabrication, not counting design time, took two days and required two people at times. We expect to live in our tent and hut full-time this winter, except for our brief trip in our van to the Bay Area. Our van is presently stashed several miles away. We are still using it for work requiring electricity, which we don't have at camp yet. In the future, we expect to use our van mainly for import-export transportation. From Vanu Live 4, November 1971. 40 by 8 feet of shelter for $30 and one day. Tents I've seen for sale are ill-suited for full-time living in wet, forested areas such as the Pacific Northwest. They are dark and dank inside and unnecessarily expensive for the space they provide. Two years ago, we were living in a teepee-shaped military surplus tent. After two days of steady rain, condensation, or leaks, we weren't sure which, dripped from every irregularity and soaked us and our gear. In disgust, we moved out, tied a rope between two trees, threw a piece of plastic over it, and found this was a big improvement. There was still condensation, but it rained down the plastic instead of dripping on us. The plastic passed plenty of light and was inexpensive. Since then, we've experimented with several variations, all using polyethylene film, builder's plastic. Based on experience so far, here is how I would erect a base camp shelter for two in a heavily forested spot where there is little wind or direct sunlight, and where the winters are mild enough to live without artificial heat. Temperatures seldom below 20 degrees. I buy a 50-foot roll of clear 6 mil polyethylene 20 feet wide. This costs about $15 and weighs about 30 pounds. This will make a tent that is 35 to 40 feet long, 8 feet wide at the ground, and 6 to 7 feet high in the center. This size is not excessive for a camp which two will occupy for several months. There are not the shelves and cabinets of a cabin or camper. Much ground area is used for storage. Polyethylene in wide widths is sold by Sears, Wards, and many building supply stores. I also buy 100 feet of inexpensive polypropylene rope, at least 1,000 pound test, and several hundred feet of lighter cord. It costs about $6. Polypropylene doesn't rot as do natural fibers and stretches less than nylon. I probably spend several days scouting a good site. I look for a 10 by 40 foot strip which needs little clearing but is among evergreen trees and high brush for shade and privacy. The strip may bend or zigzag and need not be straight. If possible, I avoid spots which show signs of washing during heavy rains. See figure 1. Narrator's note. The image is available in the PDF. When clearing, I cut as little as possible. Along the edge, I tie back branches instead of cutting. I may ditch around the high side for drainage. I check for dead trees or large branches which might blow down in a storm and pull or cut them down. I string the rope between two trees at the ends of the strip. If the trees are small, I brace to large boulders or the bases of bushes. I do not tie around a small tree. Instead, I tie the ridge rope up to a branch, see figure 2. This is to avoid damaging bark. If there is not a conveniently located tree at one end of the strip, I cut a post from a dead tree and brace it erect. If I am angling the shelter around obstructions, as shown in figure 1, I cut poles and brace them in pairs where the ridge rope changes direction. This also minimizes sag of the ridge rope. I drape the polyethylene over the ridge rope between the end trees. During winter, I tie both sides outward a couple of feet from the ground, then angle inward at the bottom and anchor with rocks, logs, or dirt. See figure 3. This shape allows the snow to slide off of the tent. If the tent were delta-shaped, the snow would pile up on the sides and stretch the plastic. I tie to the plastic every few feet by bunching it over a small pebble half inch to three quarters inch diameter. No cutting is necessary. If I use a ground plastic, I leave a few inches of bare ground between its edges and the sides of the tent so that condensation does not run onto the ground plastic. For the same reason, I do not place objects in contact with the tents. If I do not ditch, in winter I keep possessions which could be damaged by water off the ground. 
Even in a well-drained spot, water will run in once the ground outside becomes saturated. In warm weather, I move the anchor rocks along one side and tie the plastic out for greater ventilation. I leave the other side anchored to block wind. See figure 4. The pulley tent provides shelter only from rain, snow, dew, and winds. I can keep out insects by adding large pieces of curtain material or netting to the ends and open side. But more likely, I only protect the bed area by rigging a mosquito bar over it. Herder sells one for nylon, 76 by 36 by 36 inches, for about $6. During fall and winter, when days are short and we use artificial light in the evenings, I rig a blackout tarp over the bed. A 12 by 16 foot piece of black polyethylene suffices. If we cook within the tent, we use a small propane stove. If we cook on a wood stove, we do so away from the tent under a fly, all sides open of black poly. This design isn't suitable for a sunny location. Sunlight deteriorates ordinarily clear polyethylene in six months, I've read. Other problems. The tent becomes very warm. The plastic casts reflections visible for hundreds of yards. Monsanto 602 or some other plastic made especially for greenhouse use will withstand sunlight for two years, it is claimed. One source is A.M. Leonard and Sons, Box 316, Piqua, Ohio, 45356. 602 costs about twice as much as polyethylene. Comparing this shape with the covered wagon-shaped polyethylene dwelling described in Mother Earth New 16. The covered wagon shape provides more stand-up space for the same amount of plastic, but involves more work, uses more trees, doesn't shed snow, and is likely to have condensation drips. This tent has proven satisfactory in the Siskiyou from about April through October, tolerable in winter with the addition of a foam hut. And it is bright, roomy, simple, and inexpensive. From Vanu Life, 1973, March 1973, page 13. You're listening to Vanu, the search for personal freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radla from Liberty Under Attack Publications, and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again libertyunderattack.com. Now, back to the book. Foods for storage, some preliminary suggestions. Our food objective is to continue eating without being vulnerable. Living off the land sounds appealing, but doing it successfully month after month in all seasons requires much experience and long hours. After about two years of Vanu living, Dr. Gather and I obtained perhaps 20% of our food on the average from hunting and foraging. This is figuring raw weights and calories foraged food provides less than 5%. We expect to do better as we gain experience and have more time. At present, various forms of shelter are still taking most of our time, but a new Vanuan should not expect to live off the land immediately. Conventional agriculture is of course hopelessly vulnerable. We have thought about cryptoculture, growing crops in small, irregular concealed plots, but there are many problems to be solved. It's feasible right now, maybe for high-value crops such as pot, but not for the bulk of one's food. So the way to become a Vanu as possible, as quickly as possible, is to eat mostly storable foods. These must be imported, of course, but not every day or even month. Many will store 10 years or longer. And in 10 years' time, we can most likely learn to live off the land if we have to. We seek foods which are storable for a year or longer, preferably at ordinary temperatures. An expensive, total cost not much over $100 per person per year. Nourishing, a healthful diet without large additions of fresh foods. Light and compact, tasty, easily tested for edibility. All of the above figures are per person. Protein and fat are grams per day. Storage is in pounds. We may substitute some other grains and pulses for some of the brown rice or lentils, etc., but this will give an idea. Weights, costs, and calories assume one is sedentary or small and living exclusively on stores. Of course, we need more calories when active. But we eat other foods, not only wild foragings, but some purchased fresh foods during trips outside. The total cost includes $5 allowance for food supplements. The maximum and minimum storage are objectives for this autumn. We hope to eventually increase these to a 10-year supply as we gain know-how and facilities. Comparing nutritional elements with those recommended. Uh, All of these charts are in the original PDF. Apparently not much is known about the amount of fat needed except that some polyunsaturated fatty acids are considered essential. The conventional wisdom right now seems to be that 20% of calories should come from fat with at least two-thirds of that from unsaturated. However, many people, especially in oriental countries, live healthfully with 10% or less of total calories from fat. I've eaten as little as 6% for a month or more, but developed a craving for fat. Since fat foods are the most expensive, the most difficult to store, and often contaminated, this deserves further investigation. At the moment, we are avoiding processed oils and margarine entirely. 
Not only are the ingredients apt to be of low quality, but various chemicals of unknown toxicity are introduced during commercial processing. And such oils can apparently become appreciably rancid without change in taste. Rancid oils are reputed to be a major cause of aging. Oils sold by health food stores, which no oxidants are added, can be even more dangerous unless it has been continuously refrigerated since manufacture. The oil becomes rancid quicker. The information on oil rancidity is scanty and often contradictory. In the absence of more knowledge, we are playing it safe. Nuts we eat include walnuts, filberts, almonds, peanuts, and or sunflower seeds. Which ones we purchase depends on price and taste preferences. The above weights are for whole nuts. However, all but the sunflower seeds are purchased and stored unhold. Raw sunflower seeds are purchased hopefully shortly after the holing and placed immediately in a CO2 atmosphere. In the future, we hope to store all nuts, especially sunflower seeds, at not over 35 degrees Fahrenheit. However, we have stored nuts for a year at 55 degrees Fahrenheit with no appreciable change in taste. Old sunflower seeds sprout well. A test of their condition, how good a test for oil rancidity, we don't know. In the past, we have used soy as a fat source, but soy beans are apparently even more difficult to store than nuts. Ominously, soybeans will not sprout if stored at room temperature for more than one year. Our present diet includes moderate amounts of powdered milk and dry food yeast. These foods are questionable nutritionally. The processing and storage as fine particles forms oxidize substances, which are apparently a major cause of degenerative diseases. Milk is controversial in other ways as well. Some nutritionists recommend plenty of it, especially non-fat dry milk. Others do not recommend it unless it is raw milk fresh from the cow, drunk within a few minutes of milking. Still others are down on milk in all forms. These people include not only vegetarians, but some who recommend fresh meat. Also, milk and yeast are relatively expensive and difficult to store, and they are not needed for protein content. But with the present primitive state of the science of nutrition, I prefer to hedge my bet by including at least some foods of animal origin. And I seem to digest milk well, easier than wheat or beans. As we grow an ability to hunt and trap, I intend to phase out milk. We have stored dry milk, challenged non instant Jorgensen X grade, for a year at 55 degrees Fahrenheit average with no change in taste. Dried meat and fish are much too expensive to be considered, and we can get small amounts of meat without even spending time hunting by killing the slow animals we meet, an occasional rattlesnake, crayfish, or porcupine. Anyone avoiding animal foods entirely should include a vitamin B12 supplements. B12 does not occur in vegetables. We continues to form a large part of our diet and an even larger part of our stores, even though it is not as palatable or digestible as rice and many other grains. Not only is it inexpensive, it stores well, and samples can be sprouted to test condition. Rice sprouts poorly, if at all, and is reputedly difficult to store. Oil becomes rancid. Unless rice can be stored at a low temperature, white rice may be better than brown, despite the loss of B vitamins and the flat taste. Lentils and red beans both sprout well. We know of no special storage problems. We eat more lentils because we like the taste better. We purchase only whole grain, never flour or cracked cereals. Commercial flour and the pastries made from it are apparently the major cause of arteriosclerosis, arthritis, and smaller degenerative diseases. Whole wheat flour and whole grain cereals such as oatmeal and granola may be even more harmful than white flour because the oils quickly become rancid after grinding due to oxidation of vitamin E, the antioxidant. The vitamin E is oxidized within days after grinding. Dry fruit may not be justified for nutritional content, but is included for taste variety and related psychological reasons. We don't want to unconsciously associate goodies with that society. For price reasons, the fruit is mostly raisins, figs, dates, and prunes. We eat dry fruits mostly during winter and spring. During summer and autumn, we forage fresh berries. We have experimentally dried several kinds of berries with good results, but not yet in sufficient quantities to replace imports. Honey is also not justified nutritionally, but a generous amount is included, not only because it stores indefinitely, but to avoid any craving for sweets. White granulated sugar is suspect as a food. In experimental animal feedings, refined sugar produced ailments in cases where equivalent amounts of honey or other sweets did not. No dehydrated vegetables are included. In this area, at least a few grains can be foraged the year round at lower altitudes. These and sprouted alfalfa seed, lentils, and wheat provide taste variety and a nutritional safety factor. For a calcium supplement, we are using bone meal, but it may switch to oyster shell if we can purchase it in powdered form. Oyster shell tastes better than bone meal and has a higher calcium to phosphorus ratio. Some prefer dolomite because it has magnesium as well as calcium. Some nutritionists say the minimum calcium required is 0.8 grams per day. Others say twice as much calcium as phosphorus, which for us would be 4 grams per day. This is further complicated by the relative assimilation of CA and pH from various foods. Other supplements presently include alfalfa seeds for sprouting, vitamins A, C, and E, kelp for trace minerals, and various seasonings. Vitamin C and dry E will apparently store indefinitely in sealed opaque containers. Vitamin A and oil E must be kept cool. Vitamin E repeatedly counteracts the effects of rancid oil on the body, so we take a substantial dose in addition to what our food supplies. 
Dr. Gatherer and I differ on the relative merits of organic and non-organic food. Our present policy, compromise, is to pay a substantial premium for organically grown fruits and fresh, veg fresh vegetables when we buy them, but no more than 10% premium on grain or nuts. Our long-term storage of grains and nuts is within an inert atmosphere in polyethylene bags and sealed drums. To obtain the inert atmosphere, we put half-ounce dry ice per gallon volume in bottom of drum. Pour in food, tie bag loosely, and place top loosely on drum. After a few hours, the dry ice will evaporate, bottom of drum will no longer feel cold, and pressure will be equalized. Then we tie the bag and seal the drum tightly. We have stored wheat this way for over three years, and it was at least a year old when we bought it. It still sprouts well. The yearly cost can be reduced to $60 or less per year by increasing consumption of wheat and reducing consumption of everything else. But while such a diet still provides adequate protein, B vitamins, etc., we hesitate to depend heavily on a single food, both because of nutritional uncertainty and for psychological reasons. Footnotes. 1. Stale food versus fresh food. Robert S. Ford, Magnolia Laboratories, 701 Beach Boulevard, Pascagoula, Mississippi, 39567. Quote, when food is stored too long, particularly after it has been ground up, cooked, or exposed to air, sunlight, and microbes, portions of the cholesterol and other waxes, fats, oils, proteins, etc., become oxidized, hardened, dried up, and change into durable, non-food materials, which the cells in our bodies cannot utilize. When we eat these stale foods, some of the deteriorated materials become semi-permanently lodged in our flesh as arteriosclerotic deposits. The condition that makes fatty rubbish from flour so much more dangerous than any other food is its finely ground form, so fine that it can slip through the walls of our intestines with the food stream and get into our blood very easily, whereas if it were coarser, most of it would pass out of the body with little harm. Taking both the food and the quantity usually eaten into consideration, flour products such as bread, biscuits, and ready-to-eat cereals, cake, and crackers are the big killers, probably accounting for 60% of arteriosclerosis damage. Next come bacon, ham, sausages, sardines, etc., accounting for at perhaps 20%. Mayonnaise, cheese, margarine, and ice cream probably cause less than 50% of the problem, and the other miscellaneous items are only a trifle." End quote. Ford recommends eating as many foods raw as possible and cooking only by steaming or boiling. I've always been rather skeptical of most health food advocates because their explanations tend to be mystical and their recommendations contradictory. But I'm quite impressed by Ford's work, partly because his hypothesis integrates a lot of seemingly contradictory evidence. I recommend his booklet despite its price. $3.50 for 48 pages. Money back guarantee, however. 2. Many adults, including most American Indians and blacks, lack an enzyme needed for converting milk sugar and are given indigestion by milk. From Volume Life No. 3, September 1971. Editor's Note. To roughly adjust these prices for inflation, see the introduction. Soybeans. Thanks to Johnny Reb for the tip that many soybeans fail to sprout because they are hybrids and therefore sterile, not because of deterioration. Whether or not one wishes to eat sprouts, it's nice to be able to sprout as a test of condition. As previously mentioned, soybeans, which came according to the man who sold them, from Arrowhead Mills, Box 866, Hereford, Texas, 79045, $5 for 50 pounds FOB, have sprouted well and taste delicious that way after a short steaming. Unsprouted, these don't taste much different than soybeans we bought over two years ago, which never have sprouted well. From Vanu Life No. 6, March 1972. Editor's Note. Soybeans that sprout well have a black spot on them, like black-eyed peas. Non-sprouting soybeans lack this spot. I am now early 1983 paying $12 for 50 pounds of soybeans wholesale price from a local food co-op. Opting out, Vanu economic strategies. We encounter Vanuists who are succeeding, also some who aren't. A few of the latter may be drifters or dilettantes, but most are sincere, capable strivers who fail, not for lack of ability or hard work, but through errors of strategy. Some of these errors delayed Rayo's own Vanu. The following suggestions apply mainly to wilderness ways of Vanu under present conditions. Of course, they are generalities. There are exceptions. You probably already know most of these, i.e. consciously agree with them, but they may be useful as a check of your subconscious values which show up in performance. Values often lag at conscious conclusions. Be as Vanu as you can. Vanu is not an all or nothing thing. There is no way to be completely invulnerable to coercion. But this doesn't justify giving up and adjusting to depredation any more than lack of complete invulnerability to disease justifies neglecting health. Select approaches which yield maximum Vanu per time and resources expended. Vanu your home first. Domestic activities, sleeping, eating, cleaning, grooming, mending, reading, writing, listening to music, lovemaking, meditating, exercising, conversing, childcare, etc. comprise most of one's life. A Vanu home seems essential for psychological well-being. And domestic activities are relatively easy to Vanu. They do not require elaborate equipment or deep involvement with outsiders.
In contrast, earning money takes up only a relatively small part of one's life. At $2 per hour clear, 300 hours of city labor, one month with overtime, will pay for eight months of Vani living. And earning money usually requires export, difficult to accomplish without interference. So Vanu should begin at home. Most non-Vanu homes and even entire cities are only bedroom communities. Residents do not earn their money there. Most new towns begin this way. While it is nice for a Vanu home to be financially productive, this isn't essential. Have savings before moving. During your first year or two in a wilderness or other Vanu environment, expect to be occupied developing shelter and learning Vanu living skills. You will have little time for money earning even if opportunities are at hand. Suggested minimum savings for prospective tent dwellers, $2,000 for one person, $1,200 each additional person and family. These amounts include initial equipment cost of $800 for one person, $400 for each additional person, per year expenses for two years of $600 for one person, $400 for each additional person. $600 or $400 per year assumes mostly staple foods, no rent except for maybe a storage garage, little driving, relatively few luxuries, food fetishes, or status games. Some Vanuans live on much less, but don't count on doing so during your first two years. Our total expenses of two people for two years ending autumn 1971 average $622 per year per person, including substantial equipment costs and business expenses, which unfortunately we didn't record separately. We live about seven months in tents, the rest of the time in the van. Van was bought before record period. Earn money by exporting labor at first. Don't expect to earn money immediately gathering herbs or dredging gold if you have time left from home development. What opportunities are there, maybe for wilderness income, require considerable skills to pay off. Scrounging for jobs in a small town is a bad scene. Get jobs in cities if that is what you have done. Preferably temporary employment which fits your living patterns. If you have a free mate or children, let them remain at your Vanu home while you commute weekly or seasonally. Why subject them to blood, smog, and chance of nuclear incineration? Don't change vocations until you achieve a Vanu home. If you can clear $2 or more per hour in your present non-Vanu job, you'll probably achieve Vanu quickest by staying with it until you have enough capital cut loose for two years. Don't spend time getting into a slightly better non-Vanu occupation still dependent on that society if you expect to live most of your life out of that society. A do-at-home vocation such as freelance writing or mail-order selling is best developed after you have a Vanu home. Be weary of get-rich-easy schemes. If he's so smart, why ain't he already rich? If he is rich, why does he want my pocket change? Not all such schemes are conscious swindles. Many a promoter sincerely believes he has found a unique way to financial independence. But unless he is already affluent, you don't know that it worked. Even if it worked for him, it may not work for you. Opportunities change. But even if you could make it work, it probably requires heavy cycle investment involvement with the coerced economy, more than would a work-a-day job. Live frugally while in the coerced economy. It saddens us to meet would-be Vanuans who, after working 10 years at a well-paying job, don't have savings enough to opt out for even 6 months. Tactics for saving. Make a crash program of it. Save a high proportion of income for a short time. Take savings off the top, a certain percentage of income, and live on what is left. Concentrate on big or continuing expenses, usually shelter, transportation, and food, but also be careful that small luxuries don't get big. Double up with others to save rent. Drive little. See foods for storage. Some preliminary suggestions for food economy tips. Make part of your monetary savings untouchable until required capital is accumulated. Don't rationalize that such and such item is really preparation for Vanu unless you already have much experience in your intended lifestyle and know exactly what equipment and supplies you will need. Start outfitting at a local dump. Discarded blankets, clothes, utensils, then try Salvation Army stores, etc. You can gradually replace with better equipment after you are Vanu as you learn what you really need. Keep money in simple, safe forms. If your savings are small and short term, under $2,000, under two years, the best form for North Americans, all factors considered, including ease of conversion, is probably U.S. or Canadian $20 bills well hidden in several places. Currency will suffer inflation losses, but for small amounts, any other form is apt to be more trouble than it is worth. For a larger amount or a longer time, investigate gold and silver, bars or coins priced at close to metal value only, Swiss banks, etc. Avoid savings bonds or savings accounts in U.S. institutions. Don't speculate in stocks, real estate, commodities, rare coins, etc. unless you're already a full-time professional at one of those. Seek Vanu, not self-sufficiency per se. A few Vanuans cannot live in complete, permanent isolation without many years, perhaps generations of learning. And primitivism, even if achieved, would result in increasing vulnerability as aggressors' technology and methods change. A Vanu association of a few dozen to a few hundred will likely be only a little more self-sufficient than one family. A remote, non-Vanu town of this size probably has a welder, dairy, nurse, maybe even a small machine shop. 
but most goods and many services are more economical to import than to produce there. Even in a country of 100,000 people, such as Bahama, most items are imported. The major advantage of a Vanu association compared to a lone family, easier, better, import, export. Some people talk of developing a parallel economy, producing all essential supplies and spare parts before concerning themselves much with physical invulnerability. But this supposes involvement of millions of people. And what would a non-Vanu alternate economy be, anyway? An enterprise vulnerable to the state m must operate under state rules. This, not the rhetoric of its founders, will determine the way it operates, assuming it is a success. Function determines form. A real alternate economy requires Vanu, though not necessarily wilderness forms exclusively. A Vanuan can minimize dependence upon the coerced economy by stockpiling essentials, but he cannot achieve complete invulnerability. Again, Vanu is not an all-or-nothing thing. Select companions who are doing. If you link up with others, be it a single freemate or a number of associates, look for people who are already living in large part as they want to live. Of course, a lifestyle isn't static. A couple might go further into Vanu than would a single person. But this should be evolutionary growth from present living patterns, not a quantum jump. Quantum jumps are often desirable, but are best attempted alone. Many a man will say, and sincerely believe, that he wants to Vanu just as soon as he finds the right woman or the right group to do it with, but he doesn't want to do it alone. However, how do you and he know that he can do it until he does it for a substantial time? If he can't stand living alone, if he soon gets bored with himself, chances are he will soon get bored with you too. So suggest that you do it alone for a year or so before trying to link up. Long, unspectacular living in relative isolation is more significant than an occasional great adventure such as sailing a yacht around Cape Horn or scaling 25,000 foot Mount Fuchiguchi. Some, not all great adventures, are unable to stimulate themselves and structure their own time, get bored easily. Also be skeptical of the guy who says he has done it all, but is living conventionally. Why did he quit? An important exception, there are presently more male than female Vanuans, though the ratio is not as large as talk would indicate. Relatively fewer girls are bullshitters. So if you're a woman, you can be a buyer in a buyer's market. You can quickly achieve Vanu even though you lack the capital and experience by finding a man with these. In this case, it's especially important that your prospective freemates offer proven capability, not just dreams and schemes. Don't feel that you should provide half the capital or income. You offer your own values and talents, and not just erotic ones. By analogy, silver has no more uses than aluminum, but it has different ones and it is scarcer, so it doesn't exchange for aluminum one for one. Why should you? Most women adapt easier to Vanu living than do most men, perhaps because they are more self-sufficient psychologically. Their self-esteem depends more on personal and home activities, less upon a career involved with that society. Stay relatively mobile so you can respond to emerging opportunities or link up with others. Own only what you can easily move or abandon without regret. Avoid large, elaborate dens at least for the first few years. We can move our base camp and all equipment, except long-term supply caches in six weeks, which includes three weeks for exploration and preparation of a new site, plus three weeks for transport of up to 1,000 pounds by backpack to roadhead, by truck to new roadhead, by backpack to new site. Second thoughts. Reading this, I'm not entirely satisfied with my treatment of export, especially the second, fourth, and fifth topics. Regardless of proportion of time spent, some will value Vanu at export more than Vanu at home. So let's concentrate on what we value most, succeed at our own thing, and trade. Then we'll always have more Vanu everywhere. From Vanu Life number 5, January 1972. Editor's Note. To adjust these dollar amounts for inflation, see the introduction. On Acquisition of Private Land. While I often squat on public lands, I have found private property useful in some situations, especially for unattended parking of a four-wheel vehicle and for storage of other things too big and or not valuable enough to hide really well. I make these suggestions. Don't try to substitute legal ownership for physical invulnerability. Land you own is not truly yours. The state will try to tell you what you can or can't do with it and will tax you for the privilege. Depending on local regulations, you may not be able to legally build a shack, put in a septic tank, plant trees, cut trees, shoot game, or grow crops without special permission from various bludge agencies. Your land may be condemned and taken away from you for a freeway, a dam site, or a wilderness area. Ownership does not even constitute a bona fide lease from the state since the state can unilaterally change its terms at any time. Lease instead of buy if your expected use is short term, a few years or less and preferably lease from a sympathetic landlord. This can save a lot of hassles. Count the purchase price as an expense, not an investment. Taxes on visible property are the only taxes easily collected and will tend to rise to the rental value of the property, wiping out equity. Income and sales tax are increasingly evaded and or destroy their economic base. 
Property taxes are already one-third or more of rental value in much of the U.S., often in excess of rental value in NYC, resulting in abandonment of thousands of buildings. Of course, some lands may increase in value in the short term. But land speculation, along with speculation in stocks, commodity futures, rare stamps, horse races, and poker games, is rationally left to full-time professionals. Lease or buy wasteland to keep purchase price and taxes low. Avoid commercial farmland, commercial timberland, and land close to cities or recreational developments. Obtain only a few acres, by, but close by a national forest or other large stretch of unowned government-owned land as an access port for foot nomads, trogs. Get land with trees, brush, and topography adequate to conceal anything you may leave on the surface from habitations, roads, and the air. Some counties are reportedly aerial mapping for tax assessment purposes. Purchase a name of someone, real or otherwise, who has few dealings in the servile society to minimize chances that the land will be confiscated as a result of lawsuits, unpaid income taxes, etc. The owner is preferably a woman, not subject to conscription, not expected to be employed. First check out the purchase procedure. Is ID required to purchase, to sell? Must purchaser appear anywhere in person? Don't use land as a mailing address nor as legal home address on driver's license or other ID. Don't have a mailbox there. Don't have a telephone there. Maintain these addresses elsewhere. Caution everyone who uses land never to mention it as an address. Bludge agencies cross-check each other's records more and more. Get a file with one and others will come asking why you are, aren't doing this and that. Don't make permanent visible installations or improvements. Limit surface structures to vans and trailers. Do not connect to commercial electricity or other utilities. If questioned as to land use, land is unoccupied, un unimproved for occasional recreational use only. Hide vehicles as well as possible, also move occasionally. Minimize use of access roads to minimize attention. Commute to town weekly or less often, preferably on the weekends when there is maximum foreign traffic and during darkness when vehicles are not easily identified. Get land with heavy brush to discourage interlopers. Build extra bushes as necessary to encourage any hikers to go around rather than through your important places. Artificial barriers, more elaborate than a chain across the driveway, are seldom worthwhile. A high electrified fence may keep out an occasional hunter but will arouse curiosity as to what is going on. A well-concealed warning system will be of value if people live there often. I've not discussed conventional aspects of land purchase because I don't know them and because they will vary from place to place. From Vanu Life Number 1, May 1971. Vanu in Cities Most discussions of Vanu living assume unpopulated or faraway places. Concerning urban possibilities, five possible approaches come to mind. The first and simplest is anonymity. Be visible but not noticeable. Conform outwardly while doing your own thing in secrets. Be inconspicuous, as Alan Humble says in his article. Most of Humble's advice concerns what not to do. Where does Humble go to do his own thing? Probably not to his apartments. Renting under a gnome de plume does not prevent inspection by landlord or police or overhearing by nosy neighbors. Humble speaks of children, but I wonder if he has any. He said to keep children out of sight during school hours. I wouldn't want the job of keeping children quietly cooped up in an apartment during slave school hours. Incidentally, I've heard that California has lowered slave age to six. Regarding Humble's recommendation to avoid paying by check, I agree if the transaction is face-to-face, -face, large or repeating. But selling small items by mail, like Vanu Life, for cash only isn't feasible, so you're welcome to pay by check. Urban anonymity offers no protection from such dangers as nuclear war. Despite these criticisms, I agree with most of Humble's recommendations, many of which apply to all Vanuans, not just urban anonymites. I love much of the way Humble advocates before taking up van nomadism. For me, anonymity alone was unsatisfactory because of city psychological pressures. I was immersed in an alien culture with values hostile to my own. Whether or not I was especially vulnerable, I felt vulnerable. I know of quite a few Vanuists and Libertarians who live Humble's way, but I know none who seem to like it for very long. Perhaps there are ways to cope with psychological pressures. If you think you have found a way, tell us. But personally, I prefer to live far enough back in the woods. A way to reduce psychological pressures is to gather with fellows into a ghetto, a second approach to city Vanu. One loses anonymity with respect to the larger culture as one develops subculture speech, customs, mannerisms, and dress. But one becomes a relatively indistinguishable member of the subculture, requiring that any organized aggressor attack everyone or no one. All Chinese niggers hippies look alike. This doesn't always stop aggressors. Witness Jews in Nazi Germany, Japanese in U.S. The recommendations made by Walt Hayward presume ghettos of like-minded people. His objections against moving into the wildlands are directed to retreatists who hope to do it at the last moment, not at Vonnewins who expect to live there most of the time. 
ghettos are also possible in rural areas. The, the Tequilma area southeast of Cave Junction, Oregon is almost a freak ghetto. While freaks may not be in the majority yet, they're enough to render the area unattractive for anti-freaks, causing most land up for sale to be bought by freaks, etc., analogous to what happens in new black ghettos and cities. How much protection this provides remains to be seen. There have been quite a few arrests for growing, using pot, etc. A bigger crunch will come when substantial numbers of freak children become old enough for slave school. Will the Supreme Court require long hairs and short hairs to be intermixed by busing? Or will it compel kids to cut their hair at middle length with a length set by the majority vote every four years? A third approach involves a blend of concealment and deception. Construct hidden soundproof departments and workshops beneath or within an owned building, ostensibly used for other purposes. Since such chambers could be blast, fire, and fallout resistant, this approach offers some protection against nuclear attack as well as day-to-day -day predation. The family of Anne Frank, diary of a young girl, tried unsuccessfully to hide this way during Nazi occupation of Holland. The hidden chamber approach seems to have much potential, also many problems. I have not attempted it nor even thought much about it. I welcome the insights of anyone who has. A fourth approach, build a den or camouflage camp on unowned land such as a public park. This approach has much in common with wilderness fauna. Major advantage, easier access to city, disadvantages, more difficult to conceal, general hazards of city including smog and nuclear threat. A man built a shack and lived undetected for 17 years in a Portland city park, reported in Preform Inform. Park squatting might be done easiest by Vaughnians who first develop concealment skills in unpopulated remote areas, then opt for better city access. The fifth approach, van nomadism with city squat spots. Some differences from wilderness squatting. Private land, such as backyards of friends, is probably safer than streets for long stays. The vehicle not be as self-contained since utilities are close at hand. Off-the-road performance is an importance. Appearance, conventionality, license plates, etc. are important. From Vanu Life Number 5, January 1972. A Survey of Siski Region we don't wish to recognize states by saying southwestern Oregon and northern California, so we say Siskiyou region. Siskiyou includes a wide variety of terrain, soil, climate, and vegetation. The coast ranges are mostly sedimentary rock, rather soft, easily eroded into soil. The Cascade and Warner ranges and the Modoc Plateau between are mostly volcanic, hard, not easily eroded. Their surface is bare rock in many places, especially in drier areas. The Klamath ranges are composed of many different kinds of rock, from soft shales to hard granites. The rocks are often metamorphic, changed by heat, pressure, and intrusions of molten rock deep underground eons ago. Most mining in the region has been in the Klamath Mountains. There is little mining at present. Siskiyou region has a hot, dry summer, June through September, and a mild, wet winter, November through April. In winter, the prevailing west winds from the west at high altitudes, not necessarily on the surface, bring moist air from the Pacific, which deposits much snow, sleet, and rain. Precipitation is heavy as close to the coast and on the west slope of the higher Cascades, 8 or more inches per year, moderate between the coast and the Cascade ranges, 30 to 40 inches per year, in light most places east of the Cascades. In winter, typically steady rain and or snow will fall for a day or two, then several days of showers and occasional clearing, then more steady rain, snow. In winter, on the west coast of North America, temperature varies primarily with elevation and secondarily with distance east of the coast. Temperature varies little with latitude north-south. Some mountain communities in Southern California have colder but drier winters than do coastal towns of southeastern Alaska. In Siskiyou region, below 2,000 feet, snow seldom lays on the ground more than a few days. Even January and February, there are mild spells with highs in the 50s and 60s, also occasional sunny days. Summer, especially July and August, is mostly sunny and hot, except on high mountains and along the coast. The coast is usually cool with fog or clouds, while 15 miles inland, beyond the first range of hills, the sun shines brightly. Blackberries ripen in two months earlier on the Rogue River Valley than on the coast. On the coast, mean temperature change from winter to summer is only 12 degrees. September is the warmest month. In the Rogue Valley, in summer, the daily high is usually over 90 degrees, frequently over 100 degrees. On the Pacific coast, summer is somewhat warmer and drier toward the south. July and August in central British Columbia are about like June and September in Siskiyou and May and October in southern California. On the well-watered coast ranges and western slopes of the Cascades, the commonest tree is Douglas fir. On the east slope of the Cascades, the commonest tree is Ponderosa pine. The plateau further east grows mostly brush. In the Klamath Mountains, vegetation depends very much on the soil. A lush forest may be growing on a pocket of decomposing shale, while a mile away, peridotite supports only stunted knobcone pine and manzanita bushes. Little virgin timber remains, except where the trees are too small to be worth cutting. The commercial forest is mostly second growth. Lumber remains the biggest industry of the region, but is stable to declining. 
Despite the mild climate, there is relatively little agriculture. Not only is level land limited to a few river valleys, but the soil is leached in the winter and baked in summer. Even in the Rogue Valley, most crops need irrigation and fertilization. East of the Cascades, there isn't the leaching problem, but irrigation water is scarce. Even stock raising is not very extensive west of the Cascades. Grasses are poor in minerals, hay and alfalfa are tucked into supplement local forage. During the last few years, many non-vonuist agrarians, both freaks and retirees, have been attracted to Siskiyou because of its mild climate and proximity to major west coast cities. This has bid up the price of what fair crop land there is. But now the net flow of these people seems to be away to the Appalachians and Ozarks where land is less expensive and growing conditions relatively better. What is bad for agrarians can be good for Vonuans. Thousands of square miles are completely uninhabited except for berry bushes and herbs, deer and bear, and us. Except around a few settled areas and tourist attractions, one can walk a quarter mile away from a trail and be alone. Even in deer season, few people go far from the roads. The favorite hunting tactic of many rednecks is to drive along two or three in a pickup and blast whatever they scare up. In many areas, it is heavy brush, a formidable barrier to a stranger, but a friend of the Vonuin who has worked out trails. While there are a few people in the backcountry, there are enough in the larger trading centers for a comparative anonymity. Everyone doesn't know everyone else, and these trading centers are close enough at hand so that transportation isn't a big problem. Furthermore, San Francisco, Los Angeles, or Portland is only a day's drive away. For these reasons, Vanu is easier for small groups to achieve in Siskiyou than in a more remote region such as Yukon. And Siskiyou is the safest region in the U.S. in event of nuclear war. It is upwind and away from major targets. So far, we have explored very little of Siskiyou. Based on what we know now, the best subregion for year-round Vonuans is Klamath Mountains with their great variety of terrain and vegetation, including large areas of wasteland, growing trees too small for timber and brush. While Klamath Mountains includes rugged 8,000-foot peaks, there are also hundreds of valleys below snow line, desirable for someone who may be hunted as well as hunter. Water is no problem except on ridges. Even small sub-tributary creeks flow the year-round. For summer van nomads, Klamath Mountains aren't too good. Most terrain is too rugged or brushy to get a four-wheeled vehicle off of maintained trails. Lumbering of Douglas fir is mostly by clear-cutting, and used trails soon grow over. The pine forests of southern Cascades are bitter. At least this is true of areas we have seen between Medford and Klamath Falls. Extensive areas are relatively level except for a few volcanic peaks. The forest is park-like with little brush. There are more tourists, however, and foraging seems not to be as good as in Coast and Klamath Mountains. An Oregon city is better than a California city for local purchases and receiving mail. There is no sales tax in Oregon. You're listening to Vanu, the search for personal freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radla from Liberty Under Attack Publications and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again, libertyunderattack.com. Now, back to the book. Maps suggested. Forest service maps. These indicate land status, public or private, and show most roads and jeep trails. The road information is more up to date than our topographic maps. Scale of most of them is half inch equals one mile. There is no charge for these maps, but so far as we know, each must be individually ordered from or picked up at the headquarters of each national forest. In the list below, the numbers following each address indicate approximate range of latitude and longitude covered by the map. To cover Klamath Mountains, get Siskiyou, Six Rivers, Klamath, and Rogue River maps. Siskiyou National Forest, Box 440, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97526, 41.8 to 43 degrees north, 123 to 124.5 degrees west. Rogue River National Forest, Box 520, Medford, Oregon, 97501, 41.8 to 43 degrees north, 122 to 123.2 degrees west. Klamath National Forest, Eureka, California, 41 to 42 degrees north, 122.8 to 123.8 degrees west. Shasta Trinity National Forest, Redding, California, 40 to 41.7 degrees north, 120.8 to 123.5 degrees west. Ask for maps of Trinity and Shasta National Forest, Modoc National Forest, Alturas, California, 41 to 42 degrees north, 120 to 122 degrees west, Alaska National Forest, Susanville, California, 40 to 41 degrees north, 120 and a half to 122 degrees west, Suisalon National Forest, Box 1148, Corvallis, Oregon, 97330. 
43.3 to 45 degrees north, 123 to 124 and a half degrees west, Willamette National Forest, Box 1272, Eugene, Oregon, 97401, 43.3 to 43.7 degrees north, 121.8 to 122 and a half degrees west. Umqua National Forest, Roseburg, Oregon, 42.8 to 44 degrees north, 122 to 123 degrees west. Deschutes National Forest, Bend, Oregon, 43 to 45 degrees north, 121 to 122 degrees west. Fremont National Forest, Lakeview, Oregon, 42 to 43 degrees north, 120 to 122 degrees west. A question mark following the address indicates that I'm not sure where the headquarters is located. However, a letter will probably arrive if addressed. Headquarters, X National Forest. Topographic maps, scale 1 to 250,000, uh, quarter inch equals one mile of areas of interest. For example, order Medford NK 1005. The area covered by each map of this series is shown on our map in dashed lines. Ask for maps which show forested areas in green. Price 60 cents each. U.S. Geologic Survey, Denver, Colorado 80225 or Washington, D.C. 20242. Also ask for indexes for California and Oregon of 15-minute topographic maps, no charge. The 15-minute series is smaller scale, 1 to 62,500, 1 inch to 1 mile. Geologic map of Oregon, geologic map of California were 35 cents each. U.S. Geologic Survey. If you're especially interested in rocks and minerals, also write to State Department of Geology and Mineral Industries, Portland, Oregon, for an index to geologic maps they issue. We haven't found a good map of vegetation types. Climates of the states, temperature and precipitation data, and maps for Oregon and California, 25 cents each. U.S. Government Printing Office, Division of Public Documents, Washington, D.C., 20402. Sources and Siskiyou Region Food Staples Most grains and pulses are expensive in the small cities of the region when available at all. Anyone coming by motor vehicles advised to bring the supply. Sources are roughly ordered by price. Albers and other feed and grain stores are in most towns of the region, including quite small communities. Not every store has all of the following. Wheat, about $4 per 100 pounds. This is soft white wheat grown in East Washington and Northeast Oregon. It is as nutritious as hard red wheat, except for 25% lower protein content. May not store for as many years. Contains much chaff, which can be removed by washing. Chaff floats, kernels sink. Boil like rice until soft. Texture is different from rice, but boiled wheat is tasty once one gets accustomed to it. I'm eating it for breakfast as I write this. Mix wheat about 5 to 1 with beans or peas for better protein balance. Molasses black strap 5 cents per pound in customer's container. Discarded bleach jug is okay. Bone meal, feed grade, finely ground as calcium supplement, 7 cents per pound. Walnuts and shells, 35 cents per pound. Cliff's Farmer's Market, 6th Street, south of River. Grants Pass, Beans, Red, White, and Pinto, 15 cents per pound, February 1972. Warehouse Food Stores, 2100 West, 11th Eugene. Fair prices on red beans and white rice in quantity. Food Co-op was near 20th and Emerald in Eugene. Most staples, some good prices, summer 1971. Jorgensen's Dairy, 1300 Court Street, Medford. Powdered milk, $33 per 100 pounds. Walter G. Vale, northeast of Central Point, in phone book, phone first. Honey in 60-pound cans, competitive prices. High in 1971 due to poor season. Rogue Gold Cheese Factory, Central Point. Also store on 5th Street, Grants Pass. Often has store returns, ends in seconds, 70 cents per pound. Lee's Olive House, Highway 199 on West Side, Cave Junction. Most grains and seeds, including some exotic ones. Moderately high prices, brown rice, $1 for 5 pounds. Field of Merit Health Food Store, Rogue River Highway, just south of River Grants Pass, bare left next to Branch Post Office. Nice atmosphere and many staples, but mostly organic at high prices, 17 cents per pound for wheat. Okay for food stamp freaks, but not for people making do with dollars. Health Food Store, Highway 99, Central Point, same comments. Getting food stamps is a horrendous hassle in Josephine County, Grants Pass, perhaps anywhere. Requires ID, residential address, monthly interview at Food Stamp Center. Not recommended, Fall 1971. Sporting goods, including pack frames, tents, camp stoves, sleeping bags, special clothing. Prices of new merchandise are competitive with most big city prices. Absence of sales tax in Oregon helps. Hills Surplus, 6th Street, south of River Grants Pass. Has polyethylene film, 6 mil was 2 cents per square foot cut. 1.5 cents per square foot whole roll, October 1971. Also polyurethane foam, various thicknesses. Bizarre Biddle Road, Medford. Payless, East F Street, Grants Pass, also in Medford. Used clothing, cooking utensils, Salvation Army, and Medford, Grants Pass, and many other cities. Good prices, but wool clothing, etc. sells quickly. Goodwill stores charge very high prices, don't donate to them. Gasoline is usually $0.04 cents a gallon less around Central Point, Medford, than elsewhere in region. 
usually 29.9 cents per gallon, as low as 24.9 cents during wars. Propane refills, $1.50 for 5-gallon tank at the goal for shell stations on Redwood Highway, 199, southwest of Grants Pass. Most places are $1.75. Summering in Siskiyou. Suggested minimum equipment per adult. Polyethylene film, at least 20 by 30 feet for rain fly. 100 feet polypropylene rope, at least 1,200 pound test, and 100 feet of cord, at least 200 pound test for rigging fly and miscellaneous. 2 by 3 feet by 2 inches polyurethane foam for sleeping pad. Ground cloth, which may be more polyethylene film. Mosquito bar. Cheap sleeping bag or several heavy blankets. Pack frame plus some sort of heavy bag which can be lashed to it. Need not be regular pack frame bag. Hills Surplus, address above, sells an Air Force surplus welded aluminum frame for about $9, which we have found fairly satisfactory. Molded plywood frames do not stand up well in this climate. Small cooking stove. A propane stove is better than kerosene, less smell, cheaper if you have a 5-gallon propane tank for refilling the cartridge. We use grasshopper stoves sold by Payless. Refillable cylinder and adapter brings cost to about $15. Vanu cooking with wood requires waiting until night because of smoke visibility, an overhead shield which can be black polyethylene to block the light, and some sort of wood stove and open fire will melt the polyethylene. Unless you are already experienced at this, I recommend a propane stove as a backup and while learning. Dishes can be made by cutting down empty bleach jugs discarded at laundromats. Not counting initial equipment costs, maintenance, and travel, one can live for as little as $10 per month in summer by squatting and by eating mostly wheat supplemented with foraging. In a few days scouting, you can find a better squat spot than any we could publish here, since to do so would reduce its privacy. Find a wooded area, preferably on public land, and look around. We don't recommend trying to meet us or other Vanuans the first few weeks you are in the region. Meeting would be difficult for you and for us. And you'll probably learn more doing things on your own at first than talking with us. A meeting will be more worthwhile later when we have some experience in common. But do write us and we'll reciprocate, sometimes slowly. If we find ourselves exchanging many letters and things too, maybe we can set up a joint drop to save postage. For summer fellowship, you might try wandering some of the more accessible mountain valleys. You'll come upon assorted squatters and campers from young freaks to old prospectors. At least this was the situation last summer. Interesting people, mostly though naturally you usually won't see the more vani ones. Don't hang around the towns. The bloods are hostile to strangers, especially freaks. One friend got hassled three times in three days in Grants Pass. Nighttime is especially bad. Of course, keep your camp tidy and be very careful with fires, and even if the forest fuzz discover you, they probably won't bother you, at least this was true last summer. If you're still around Siski, you come winter or return next summer, and if Vanu is your big thing, let's see if we might Vanu better together. From Vanu Life number 6, March 1972. Editor's Note. Many of the stores mentioned above may be out of business, or may have moved, and the prices are of historical interest only. See the introduction for help in adjusting the prices for inflation. A Search of Dr. G and Rayo We find wilderness Vanu addicting, often delightfully so, sometimes painfully so. Several years ago, when we became van nomads, that lifestyle seemed to offer the optimum combination of isolation and access. We were not content to spend a week or two in that society if we could spend several weeks out of it. As time passed, so did some of our hang-ups, and we wanted to be further out and out more of the time. Now much of the time, we no longer live in our van. We can't get it far enough out. We still use our van for supply, communication trips into that society, and more and more of those trips are bummers. No, it's not that society is getting worse. We are not beat up, thrown into jail, nor run out of town whenever we show up. It's just that our tolerance for shit becomes progressively lower. Keeping up ID, licenses expire and need a residential address, keeping things on and in our van legal, worrying about our personal appearance being too freaky, etc. I really like E's comments about putting one's body and house on the highway. Quote, the small space occupied largely by those guys with the red lights on their cars, end quotes. Of course, bludge land isn't just the pavement. It's all the space visible from and easily accessible from highways, streets, and roads. For example, almost all the houses, shops, and farms of that society. A big advantage of van nomadism over conventional ways is not that the pavements are safer than the rest of bludge land, but that a nomad spends less time on the pavements and in the rest of bludge land. Several years ago, when I was just a sheep person with illusions of enlightenment, maintaining surf tags, ID, etc. seemed trivial. When one is waist deep in sewage, what's another turd, more or less? Now these are the most unvanny parts of our lives and are correspondingly unpleasant. We have some experience with bicycles and don't think they're an answer. A bike means more time in bludge lane per trip, more red lighters, and other dangerous drivers whizzing by. As for bikes not needing licenses, that is just a liberty, legal interest ice, not a vanu, relative physical invulnerability, and probably a short-lived one. Already tax-hungry bludge in California are proposing state licensing of bikes, just like automobiles. 
The fees will supposedly go for maintenance of bikeways. Big deal. Nor are we interested in total isolation, yet at least. We believe primitivism would mean less Vanu in the long run. Primitive societies run afoul of bloodlines sooner or later. Consistent avoidance of something requires some knowledge of it. And there are too many capabilities, things we wish to develop which require equipment, materials, and knowledge out of the other society. Technology our society doesn't have yet. But personal travel isn't necessary for import-export. All that is needed for now is a way to get parcels and messages in and out, interfaces with the freighting and communication services of that society. Avoidance of personal travel into Bludgeland is not without costs. We must buy a particular part, new, through Sears catalog instead of picking it up used at a swap meet. Nor can we engage in business which requires face-to-face -face encounters. But these costs are small compared to the savings, at least for us. This brings me to the retired farmer with a pickup truck, who Adam proposed hiring. It is one thing to get some stuff hauled around once a year. It is something else to get mail, parcels picked up and delivered every couple of weeks, which is what we would like. The latter service requires somebody who is not only reliable, but closed mouth and in sympathy since he is apt to be hassled sooner or later. There are such people, we know several, but they are few and far between. Dr. G and I would probably be happy to pay $4 per trip, $100 per year for such a service. For $4, someone in that society cannot afford to go much out of his way to pick up deliver at our drop. Even though the retired farmer is sympathetic, he is very much in that society, incurs the high overhead, psychic, even more than financial there, and will expect to be paid at that society's going rate. Assuming he goes to town every other week anyway, for $4 it might be worth his while to drive 5 miles out of his way to our drop. This severely limits our base location. A desirable wilderness area is not apt to be within a few miles of the relatively few applied libertarians we could trust to provide such a service. Even if we find such a combination of person in place, suppose he gets sick or moves away. We must move to or pay much higher fees to somebody living further away. But if, say, 10 Vanuan families or groups lived within a 20-mile diameter area and each would pay $4 for interface service, that's $40. $40 will hire an applied lib one day every two weeks, pay for his time and 100 miles or more of driving expenses. We and our drops need not be near his home. Such a service is not to replace long-term storage of supplies we know we will use, such as 100 pounds of food staples, but for procurement of the unpredictable items and information, a special part for a new device we are developing, a drug to treat a rare disease, a book. So Dr. G and I are seeking other Vanuans who, one, have enough mobility to locate in the same area, and two, have interfacing needs similar to our own. For example, desire fairly frequent parcel carrying, two, from that other society, but do not wish to visit that society more often than once a year, if that often. Our association needn't be a close togetherness thing. One need to prove the way the other combs his face. We can have as much or as little internal trade and personal contact as we want. Dr. G and I are fairly mobile. At present, we can move our base with less than one month's labor, and we are not hung up on any particular wilderness spots, nor is moving Vanu life to a new post office especially difficult. For climate and nuclear fallout reasons, we probably aren't interested in any area outside the Pacific Northwest, Northern California through Southwest Alaska, unless it's outside of North America. And we want to be at least 100 miles away from and upwind of the metro areas of Vancouver, Seattle, Portland, and San Francisco. Perhaps we can come together in Siskiyou region, then when there are more, 20, 30 families, move to the north coast of British Columbia and find an applied libertarian with a boat instead of a pickup truck. There are probably more miles of waterways along BC coast than there are miles of roads and streets in California plus Oregon. Climate and terrain there aren't too different from here, somewhat wetter, only a little colder. More people would be necessary there than here for an nightly interfacing to be economical since the interface would probably travel hundreds of miles. We are seeking only those with enough Vanu living experience, especially living in relative isolation, to know their own minds. And with savings or a source of income not requiring physical presence in that society much of the time. If this idea appeals to you, but you are inexperienced, I suggest first trying Vanu living by yourself in an area convenient to you. We already know at least two applied libertarians in Siskiyou region who would probably be interested in providing pickup delivery. The problem is coming up with enough of a market to make it worth their while. If you think your head is anywhere close to ours, do write. Let us know your experience, present situation, and objectives. Also thoughts you have about interfacing with that society. This is a long-term project of ours. It probably won't happen in a month or two. So if you first read this many moons from now, chances are we will still be interested, if not already coming together. From Vanu Life Number 6, March 1972. Report on Progress and Problems Shelter Shelter development is still our biggest activity. Our situation the past year. Avanu, comfort, convenience, winter. We can have any three of the four, but not all four at once. For example, we can live in Vanu in comfort with convenience, but not in winter. We can be comfortable in Vanu during winter if we forego convenience to do many things, etc. 
We are still living most of the time in polyethylene A-tents, part of the time in our van. Our A-tents survived the winter with one minor mishap. There was an exceptionally heavy snow while we were away. Snow slid down the poly and piled up at the bottom on each side, bowing in the sides and dragging down the ridge rope. The poly was punctured in a few places by sharp cornered objects under it but didn't tear, nor did the polypropylene ridge rope 1200 pound test break. Other problems with the simple A tents. Cold and cold weather, no insect screening of tent as a whole, we use mosquito bar over bed only. No blackout of tent as a whole, again we use curtain over bed. Reflections from sides which slope south, east, or west are visible for several hundred yards. Fastening of sides must be changed whenever weather changes from wet, cool, to hot, or back. Frequently during spring and autumn, clear poly has a short life in the daylight. Our poly tent has held up almost a year now, but little direct sunlight strikes it. We tented it near the ridge with cheap spray paints for possible ultraviolet protection and for better blending with the surroundings. The paint rubs off easily, but this isn't a problem so long as the tent doesn't move much. The paint appears much lighter on the poly than on the top of the can, so dark shades should be purchased. Our lay foam hut has proven very satisfactory for tasks which can be accomplished in a reclining position, such as sleeping, reading, eating, erotics. We sleep in it from October through May. With two people inside, temperature rise over outside was about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, about 6 inches above the floor. During warm weather, the door was left open, covered only with netting. The 2-inch thick open cell polyurethane foam commonly sold for mattresses breathed well. Even on the wettest days, the inside stayed dry, though beads of moisture condensed and kept evaporating on the outside. This was with two of us breathing inside with all vents closed. The foam hut was inside the poly tent, which sheltered it from the rain. At first, we laid the foam hut directly on the plastic ground cloth, but apparently moisture diffusing through the bottom condensed on the plastic and caused puddles in low spots. Then we built a foundation of bows a few inches above the ground and ground cloth, which solved that problem. No stiffness was noticed inside. A vent plug about 6 inches in diameter was removed from the top when we used a kerosene lamp inside. The lamp was placed under the vents. Ordinary foam is very inflammable, so care is required around fire. We replaced the internal brace to prevent sagging with cords to overhead runner ropes which also held up the blackout tarp. The foam sit hut is not yet satisfactory. Temperature rise was only 15 degrees Fahrenheit over outside one person. Not enough for work requiring bare hands on cold days. Temperature rise was no greater than in lay huts, also 15 degrees with one person, even though dimensions were smaller, 4 by 6 by 2 feet versus 4.5 by 9 by 2 feet, probably because there wasn't a tight fitting at the waist. I had hoped that the warmed air being lighter would remain trapped within the hut, but apparently there was much convection. Either a snug waist closure or a bottom will be needed for greater warmth. Already it is difficult to get in or out of and to pull additional things inside. A tight closure or bottom will increase difficulties. Foam is easy and forgiving material to work with. A piece not quite the right size can be compressed or stretched into place. A miscut piece can be glued back together. A join with the proper foam cement is as strong as the foam. Foam is fairly expensive though. Our lay hut consumed over $50 worth. In winter spring 1971, we built a small den intending to use it for a workshop and storage. First problem was condensation. In summer, warm air trickles in and cools. Relative humidity rises past 100% and dew condenses on everything exposed. Last autumn I put in a fix, I hoped, and left it alone for the winter. I have yet to learn if the condensation problem is solved because last winter it flooded. The den almost filled with water, the things stored in it washed around some and got wet. For drainage, there was a 4 inch pipe topped by a 1 foot cross section of rock covered with plastic to keep finer dirt out. This gives an idea of the flow of water. The water apparently welled up from the bottom. The structure was intact except for some washing near the entranceway. I opened up entrances to the drain some more in case clogging was the problem. Next spring I'll visit it again and see if the problem is solved. But for now anyway, I'm turned off to completely underground structures too big to be assembled away from sight, watertight, and packed in. For example, much larger than a 55 gallon drum. Not only are condensation and drainage likely problems, but much equipment is needed to make a den livable. Artificial light and ventilation at least. And the basic structure must be strong to withstand soil pressure weight. This results in the structure being heavy. This, in turn, requires that the structure be built mostly of native materials. Prefabricated sections would be too heavy to backpack very far. No point having a den if there is a conspicuous vehicle trail leading to it. Volume of our den is about 400 cubic feet. Construction time of basic structure was about 400 person hours. Materials cost less than $100, mostly plastic film, cord, pens, nails with heads clipped off, drain pipe, and plywood and glue for entrance. Most time consuming was not digging, but preparing timbers. Scouting trees which could be removed without altering the appearance of the environment, cutting, trimming, transporting, smoothing, or debarking, drilling holes for pens. 
This was all done with hand tools. The only power tools which would have saved significant time would have been a drill sander. I now believe our first den was over designed with respect to Vanu considering the remote and rugged area in which it was located. I would guess the mean time to discovery MTD under present conditions as 2000 years. An MTD of 2000 means that if I had 2000 such dens I would expect one per year to be discovered by somebody. We are now working on two types of shelter. The first we call a Plinu. That name has no particular significance. It is semi underground like the Shushwap, but of different form to provide more light and hopefully remain dry in wet climates. After the problems with the den, I am proceeding cautiously. I am only building the basic structure this summer and autumn. If that stands up to winter rain, snows, and winds, we intend to com complete it and move in in early spring. Hopefully early enough to check its insulative qualities. The interior will be insulated from outside air, but not from the ground, thus using the ground as a heat source during winter and as a heat sink during summer. Ground temperature a few feet down remains about 55 degrees Fahrenheit during the year around in most areas of this region. I expect the inside will remain about 50 degrees Fahrenheit on all but the coldest days. Our objective is to be able to perform all kinds of work and comfort without an artificial heat source. I'm designing for 50 years MTD. The second type of shelter is an improved poly tents. Unlike the Plinu, it is for warm weather use only. It is simpler and easy to construct than the Plinu. We have sent inquiries to many manufacturers and dealers in polyethylene, but have yet to find a source of wide at least 16 feet plastic in colors other than clear and black, and quantities less than 5,000 feet. A source for Monsanto 602, a clear poly with ultraviolet inhibitor, is A.M. Leonard & Sons Horticultural Tools, Box 816, Piqua, Ohio, 45356, developed for greenhouse use. 602 supposedly lasts two years in direct sunlight, compared to six months for ordinary polyethylene. But a 20-foot by 100-foot sheet costs $39 plus shipping, compared to $20 to $30 West Coast for ordinary clear. For general storage, we are now using wide mouth steel drums in the 10 to 17 gallon range with tops clamped with circumferential bands. With a good gasket, these seal water tight. We store food and other supplies which must be kept dry in 4 mil poly bags within the drums. For long storage, I place drums under a small open sided poly A tent, similar to A tent previously discussed, but with black poly for longer life. Sides are tied out, as with summer tent, for ventilation and snow protection. The tent provides extra shade in summer and rain snow protection in winter, which reduces rusting of the drums and saves contents in case both gasket and bag leak, which has happened with one drum in 20. New gaskets would seal better, but I haven't found a source. General thought on shelter. Build small shelters and have several in an area, far enough apart so that discovery of one is not likely to lead to discovery of others. Use soft foot gear such as moccasins lined with foam for travel between them and to water source and latrines to minimize disturbance of ground. Good conservation and vanu. Use hard foot gear, regular boots, only when hiking outside of home area. Advantages of multiple small shelters. Many more suitable sites. Easier to put under between trees and bushes with little cutting. Not as visible. Small structure with few possessions appears less permanent if discovered, less likely to arouse curiosity or hostility. Disadvantages. Travel between them. Items not always in hand when wanted. Vanu. We have much less contact with unsavory characters now than three years ago when we were living in a van in Southern California. The improvement is due partly to living in a less populated region, partly to our increasing skills. While living at secluded squat spots during the last 18 months, three groups have seen our van. Two of these, including the only bludge, happened by while we were parked on private land with permission. One object, weighing 50 pounds and worth about $15, was stolen from a stash we had on private land with permission. No stranger has seen any of our camps, even though some of them have been in relatively accessible areas. No one has molested us personally. Projects for the next year include warning systems and more telltale techniques, the latter to indicate if anyone has been near our shelter in our absence. The bad guys may be trying harder, but we are getting better at hiding much faster than they are getting better at seeking. It's amusing to read letters from people, conventional dwellers mostly, who delight in telling Vanuans about all the things Big Brother will do to stop them unless they join a political crusade or something. Big Brother already has 60 million laws and regulations or so. If all laws were consistently enforced, almost every man, woman, and child would be in prison for one or more violations. But Big Brother can only extort so much taxes to hire bludge and build spy devices. And taxes are already to or beyond the point of diminishing return. Each additional rule to be enforced means existing rules get enforced less. Someone is worried because the bludge are talking about requiring permits to enter public lands. To put this in proper perspective, consider that for many decades permits have been required to hunt, even small game in most states. How many mountain people have ever shot a rabbit or squirrel at least? How many had a permit to do so? How many went to jail or were fined for doing so? 
Of course, there are game wardens, and every now and then they catch somebody. The few convictions I have heard of were all circumstantial evidence. Somebody's deep freeze was searched, and a deer meat was found. No doubt the suspect had invited all his friends and relatives to a venison banquet, and somebody talked. Around Siskiyou, some freaks are still using 18th to 19th century methods. Someone walks several miles into the woods on public lands and builds a conventional cabin out of trees he cuts to clear a garden. And so far, the Bludge do not even have the resources to find and run off these people. Or perhaps the Bludge know that if they start hassling a lot of people, some of the least imaginative will start burning the woods. And that would make many people unhappy, including the Bludge's superiors. The bureaucracies obtain a large part of their funds by selling timber to lumber and paper companies. We should not get cocky and careless, of course. I appreciate specific, detailed information on tactics and devices in use or readily available, along with suggestions on how to foil those. I have no use for vague, hysterical warnings. Ways of fighting back should be considered, but nothing so foolish as shooting at every bludge one sees or joining political movements. There are several thousands of years of evidence that this kind of fighting back only makes matters worse. Regarding Paul D's concern about super metal detectors, rocks do move around here at least. Not every rock every day, of course, but they get pried out by roots, turned over by bears, washed down hillsides, knocked over by other rocks, etc. About bears, while they can be fantastically destructive, they create excellent diversions. One bear in one day will alter the landscape more than will a Vanuan in a year, if the Vanuan is halfway careful. To obtain food, a bear turns over rocks, digs after little ground animals, and breaks down branches on berry bushes. Anyone seriously looking for squatters would need a crew of men in a helicopter full-time to check out the work of each bear, or else they must exterminate all bears. Then there are deer, porcupines, pack rats. Of course, bears don't build fires or use metal drums, so woods Vanuans may eventually have to keep fire and metal under cover, stop using them, or create diversions. Anyone really worried about super metal detectors can always gather up a few dozen empty cans at a dump and leave them here and there, preferably under trees and bushes in rugged country where a helicopter can't land. Also leave a few hanging from trees in such a manner that they will bang together now and then for the benefit of detectors, which detect the sound of metal against metal. And one day, one person could scatter enough cans to keep a crew with super metal detectors busy for at least a year. Of course, wilderness vaunting may not be as easy here as it apparently is in totalitarian Russia, where whole factories are hidden in ravines. Thanks, Paul D., for lead to non-electric radiation detector. I wrote for further information. Olsen has cut the price of their surplus CD detector to $5 plus shipping. Possibly it is not selling well. Their order number is XX-113, Olsen Electronics, 260 South Ford Street, Akron, Ohio, 44327. Anyone know of a source for an inexpensive nuclear war detector? This is most likely a special AM radio receiver which sounds an alarm if most broadcast stations shut down or change frequency. It could be made by interfacing an alarm with the automatic gain control circuit of a radio, but there might be time-consuming problems, so I'd rather buy one. Without such a device, we might not learn that a nuclear attack was made until days or weeks later, and in just radioactive fallout we could have avoided. Back to bears. How can they be repelled from a camp not occupied for two months? We have been using a single-strand barbed wire electrified fence, but we have been told this won't stop a bear, and so far a bear hasn't come around to test it out. I have thought of saving up urine and bleach jugs, then when leaving, tie these upside down at intervals around the perimeter and adjust the tops for a slow drip. Will urine retain the proper smell for several months? Has anyone tried this? Power. We cooked on a wood stove made from a five gallon can when we first moved from a van to a base camp, but we have switched back to propane more and more. Now we only cook with wood on an overnight trip where weight is crucial. We switch back for Vanu and convenience. With wood, we felt we should restrict cooking to nights and rainy days when smoke would not be visible. But at night, fire and any light source should be shielded. Also, wood smoke is heavier than air once it cools, flows down the hills and along creeks, and can be smelled a long distance away. Finally, wood gathering and sawing means more activity near camp and more disturbance of environments. While propane must be imported, we require little. A five-gallon tank now lasts us six months thanks to techniques Dr. G has developed. Sprouted wheat and beans are palatable after boiling for a minute or two. For rice or millet, the pot is brought to a boil and then immersed in blankets or foam to retain heat. One further refinement will be to insulate the sides and top of the pot so that less heat is lost while heating to a boil. And we eat many foods raw. With maximum use of insulated cooking, we might be able to generate enough methane from our own shit to replace propane. Other possibilities, charcoal generated in large batches in a kiln away from camp, 12-volt electric immersion heater plus insulated pot when we have hydroelectric, solar cooking during summer. I hope to experiment with one or more of these during the next year. 
Artificial light we use mostly during winter and autumn, at present a kerosene lamp. During the longer days of spring and summer we go to bed at dusk. For several years now I have wanted to put in a small hydroelectric system, an impulse turbine or a vein pump, the latter suggested by Sky Diarrhuis, driving an automobile alternator. But I've been waiting for a shelter more permanent than an A tent since there will be several hundred feet of pipe to lay. Even a small creek will provide enough power for our uses. I would like electricity for a fluorescent light to replace the kerosene lamp and for some electronic development work. At present, we use a small gasoline engine driving an auto generator for battery charging. Sanitation. I'm dissatisfied with our present shallow latrine system. Dig a new hole after each defecation using the dirt to fill in the old hole, because a large area of ground is eventually disturbed and because of travel between shelter and latrine. We may experiment with deeper holes plus buckets. Any suggestions? Food. Our diet has not changed much recently. Most of our nutrients still come from stored staples, especially whole grains, pulses, and nuts. From February to August, we kept records of stored and purchased foods consumed. Quantities are pounds per person per month. Costs are calculated from most recent bulk prices paid. Stored staples. Wheat, 15.8 pounds, 67 cents. Brown rice, 6.9 pounds, 69 cents. Shelled sunflower seeds, 5.8 pounds, $2.27. Raisins, 4.8 pounds, $1.13. Popcorn, 4.5 pounds, 52 cents. Red beans, 4.4 pounds, 48 cents. Walnuts and shells, 3.7 pounds, 74 cents. Millet, 1.6 pounds, 32 cents. Dry milk, 1.6 pounds, 69 cents. Buckwheat, 0.8 pounds, 16 cents. Soybeans, 0.8 pounds, 12 cents. Blackstrap molasses, 0.7 pounds, 4 cents. Sugar, 0.6 pounds, 7 cents. Dry kelp, 0.4 pounds, 4 cents. Alfalfa seed, 0.4 pounds, 18 cents. Dry yeast, 0.22 pounds, 16 cents. Limestone flour, 0.19 pounds, 3 cents. Subclover seed, 0.18 pounds, 8 cents. Also, vitamin pills and seasonings, estimated 40 cents. Total, 52.4 pounds, costing $8.76 per person per month. We ate generously of sunflower seeds because we had a large stash and didn't know how well they would keep. Other purchase foods, oranges 6.2 pounds, 75 cents, grapefruit 2.8 pounds, 28 cents, bananas 3.4 pounds, 35 cents, apples 0.3 pounds, 3 cents, watermelon 1.3 pounds, 9 cents, carrots 0.8 pounds, 9 cents, cabbage 0.7 pounds, 8 cents, beef 0.8 pounds, 57 cents, eggs 5, 14 cents, cheese 0.5 pounds, 24 cents, Canned fish, 0.3 pounds, 18 cents. Buttermilk, 0.1 quart, 3 cents. Ice cream, 0.4 pounds, 5 cents. Margarine, 0.3 pounds, 9 cents. Butter, 0.1 pounds, 7 cents. Oil, 0.13 pounds, 5 cents. Garlic, 0.06 pounds, 6 cents. Pastries, 0.2 pounds, 12 cents. Smorgasbord meals, 0.35 meals, 1 pound, 37 cents. Total, $3.63 per person per month. I have listed averages for comparison, but our actual purchases were irregular. For example, during this 5.6 month period, we purchased one 15 pound watermelon and ate it several days later all in one day. We purchased meat twice and each time consumed it within a few days. Oranges, the most frequent purchase, were bought during five trips and after each lasted only for a week or two. Replacement value of purchased food consumed during this period was $12.39 per person per month whereas average expenditure on food calculated for the entire year was $22.40 per month. See next section. Reasons for differences. Stores of staples were increased. Trips during the 5.6 month period were few and brief and including not more than two days in populated areas. Scavenge food from grocery trash bins. Guess. Fruit 4 pounds, melons 1 pound, vegetables 3 pounds. We made three big hauls during this period, about 100 pounds total. Foraged wild foods. Guess. Meat, clean but including bones, 1 pound, berries, 0.4 pounds, greens, 0.3 pounds. Many berries were picked and eaten while doing other things. Dr. Gatherer sprouts alfalfa, subclover, and buckwheat all year, which we eat raw as a salad. Wheat is usually sprouted for a day or two to reduce cooking time and improve flavor and digestibility. Some is eaten raw. For breakfast, I usually have sprouted wheat and beans about 4 to 1, briefly boiled. Dr. G usually fasts until noon. During the day, we have one or more snacks of fruits, nuts, milk, occasionally popcorn. For dinner, we have sprouts and any other fresh vegetables as a raw salad, any meat, any starch food, which may be rice, millet, popcorn, or bread homemade out of whole wheat flour we grind ourselves. 
Often flavor rice or millet with walnuts or sunflower seeds. If, if there is no meat, Dr. G often makes up a stew of beans or lentils and kelp plus any cookable fresh vegetables on hand. The berry we gather and eat most frequently is Manzanita, Arctos phyllos, which grows abundantly in many areas near the Pacific coast. It is easy to pick, strip off twigs, separate debris while eating, and is palatable if not delectable throughout summer. Sometimes we reach areas growing many blackberries, black raspberries, or amelanchier, Saskatoon berries, at the right time and in any good season and pick gallons in a few hours. But except on such occasions, forage berries are expensive compared to imported fruit, even with our low overhead. On a typical occasion, I gathered 9 ounces of red huckleberries, vaccinium, in 2 hours. So on our infrequent trips to town, Dr. G and I top our load on, on the return with fresh fruit and vegetables to the maximum weight we can handle. During the last few months, forage meat has included several mice, one rat, several squirrels, one porcupine, one rattlesnake. The mice and rat were caught in ordinary households type traps. We began trapping for reasons of self-defense, then decided not to waste the meat. The mice were prepared as Olson's outdoor survival handbook suggests. Remove skin and guts, then grind or pound them up, bones and all, into a patty. All rodents taste about the same. Mice are easy to trap in winter and early spring, but not the rest of the year when their food is more plentiful. The porcupine and, the, and rattlesnake we just happened upon. The porcupine was impressive until it was cleaned. It seemed to be mostly guts. The liver, though, was big and good tasting. Its muscle meat was tough even after a long boiling. The rattlesnake killed with a stick was easy to clean, mild flavored, and very bony, time consuming to eat. The only deliberate hunting recently has been done by Dr. G, who obtained squirrels and larger animal. Cleaned weight of small game. Porcupine about 3 pounds, most squirrels gray, over 1 pound. Rattlesnake 2 foot, 9 ounces. Rat 4 ounces, mouse half ounce. Cleaning and pounding up one mouse takes me about 10 minutes, so unless I become more adept, mice are expensive meat. Nutritionally, we prefer small game to deer because we eat it fresh. No preservation problems. We are still using some powdered milk and dried yeast, which is probably undesirable for long-term good health. In April, we resolved to purchase no more meat because of expense, contaminants, staleness, and preservation difficulties. So far, we have kept to it. On two occasions, I went for a period of two months with little animal protein and discovered toward the end of the period that I could not do rigorous physical work two days in a row. If I attempted to, I felt extremely weak. I felt okay so long as I worked every other day. Since I had vitamin and mineral supplements and plenty of calories, I'm inclined to believe I had a marginal protein deficiency. Dr. G has not experienced this. Our staple diet contains more than recommended minimums of essential amino acids and seeds and nuts, but the human digestive system may not be efficient at digesting protein in the presence of a large amount of carbohydrates. Seeds are a mixture, and digestive efficiency varies from person to person. We have not yet put much effort into trapping. Shelter and storage have been consuming most of our time. When we do, probably this autumn, we hope to obtain enough small game to replace dry milk and yeast. Also, we will experiment with many grow holes for year-round fresh vegetables. Finances Dr. G and I recorded personal expenditures for a period of one year ending this month. Results Food $536.42 subtotal including dry staples, storable, $365.45, spices and flavorings, storable, $10.65, fresh fruit, $48.54, fresh vegetables, $11.91, fresh meat, cheese, eggs, fluid milk, $58.32, junk foods, store-bought ice cream, cookies, bread, TV dinners, canned foods, candy, $17.89, prepared meals, restaurants, visiting friends, $17.86, shelter and storage, $713.05, subtotal including materials such as plastic, film, foam, rope, cord, drums, nails, $452.86, appliances, devices, and their parts, including stove, lanterns, pack frame, inverter, traps, etc., $116.34, space rental, mostly for storage, $43.24, propane and kerosene for cooking, lighting, and occasional heating, van, $21.50, tools, $14.61, cleaning and miscellaneous supplies, $14.50, transportation, $201.24, subtotal, including gasoline, including tax, $124.06, Parts and oil, $60.08. Licenses and tolls, $17.10. Clothing, $72.22. Subtotal including materials, thread and needles, $26.24. Footgear, $26.62. Other ready-to-wear clothing, $9.81. Laundromats, when in towns, $9.95. Communication, $64.57. Subtotal including books and magazines, $32.67. 
Postage, partly estimated, $15. Phone calls, $10.90. Stationary, partly estimated, $6. Other, $32.82. Subtotal, including medical, dental, and personal supplies and services, $28.95. Taxes, federal excise, and California state sales tax, not counting gasoline, $0.71. Cents. Miscellaneous, $3.16. Errors and unrecorded plus three dollars and forty seven cents total one thousand six hundred sixteen dollars and eighty five cents for one year for two people. We are surprised and chagrined at the total, higher than the average for the two previous years. Explanations We built up stores of staples, shelter material, and clothing materials, so these figures do not represent one year's consumption. Also, many shelter items are hopefully durable goods. On the other hand, our van and motorcycle are depreciating but probably won't be replaced. Much of our shelter work is intentionally experimental and therefore scrap generating, so we might consider it a business expense. We are still betwixt and between two lifestyles, van nomadism and something we are still developing, discovering, which increases costs. Excuses. Seldom were we consciously stingy. We bought most of the things that we saw or knew of that we wanted, but few things of that society appeal to us anymore. Exceptions. No meat or restaurant meals purchased since April. We bought some new books, but passed up others on the supposition we could buy them used, borrow them from friends, or scan at libraries. We put 4,300 miles on a van, including two round trips of 2,500 and 800 miles, and about 2,000 miles on a motorcycle. Our trips to towns of the area were few and brief, but we loaded up on fresh fruits and vegetables when we came back. Most of the junk foods were consumed one several weeks stay around large cities. The psychological pressures began to get to us. Comparing our expenses with those of a traditionalist agrarian family, the Coleman's reported in Wall Street Journal and reprinted in the Mother Earth News number 11. Per person, counting their two-year-old daughter as one half. Food, $268 us compared to $200 them, though they claim to grow 80% of theirs. Transportation, $101 us and we are nomads to $300. Uh, tools, $7 to $80. Shelter, except tools, $350 to $80. Their conventional cabin was completed and land was purchased previously. Other, $83 to $140. Total, $808 us to $800 them. While we are interested in developing Vanu sources of income, so far we have been more concerned with reducing expenses. If expenses are very low, only a few weeks per year spent in a city will suffice to earn money. Associations, Attitudes, Objectives At the moment, there are very few Vanuans, perhaps several hundred in North America. And these are many different places and different lifestyles. Many are not in contact with each other. At times, Dr. G and I crave association with more people, not only for economic benefits such as pulling outside purchases and trips, but for interaction with different minds. But we have discovered that association with sheep people or bullshitters only makes us lonelier. Such association is like a drink of salt water to a thirsty man. We much prefer to just be with the trees, flowers, birds, brooks, and the few people with whom we share values and goals. But I don't think this will be a problem for long. More and more people are rejecting the attitudes and roles of the servile society. While only a small minority of the whole population, they number tens of thousands. Some attempt to turn back the clock to, by moving to farms or small towns. But rural dwellers are conspicuously unfree, so those who really want freedom will search in other directions. A Vanuan to me is not just someone living in a particular manner. Lifestyles may change. A lifestyle which was Vanu 100 years ago may not be Vanu today. Some lifestyles Vanu today were not possible 100 years ago and may not be Vanu 50 years from now. A Vanuan is someone who places a high value on relative and vulnerability to coercion, someone for whom freedom is worth a fair amount, though not infinite, of effort and convenience discomfort. To a Vanuan, Vanu is not just a means to other ends, nor it is an ultimate end. Like most qualities of life and life itself, it is both. A Vanuan will choose whatever way of living offers personal sovereignty and will change lifestyle again and again if necessary. Although lifestyle may vary, a Vanuan can be identified only by what he does, especially by perseverance over a long period, not by what he says. Words are cheap. This is not to reject ideology. Someone who does not see through the mist of the state will not for long remain Vanu. If by good fortune, he should become Vanu. But anti-state ideology isn't enough. If freedom were free, more precisely if Vanu were gratis, almost everyone would be free, Vanu. But freedom isn't free. It is quite expensive and will likely remain costly in the foreseeable future. Most people presently alive do not value Vanu very much. One reason, perhaps, is that during thousands of years of pre-technological agriculture, civility had a survival value. During this period, conventional farming was the most efficient way of producing food, and it is difficult to conceive a lifestyle more subject to coercion than that of the traditional farmer. Not only is he visible and usually separated from his fellow, but his home and land are especially vulnerable to attack. Servility was not generally pro-survival prior to agriculture. 
When North America was settled, few of the natives who were mostly hunters foragers were successfully enslaved. To obtain obedient subjects, the Bludge had to bring slaves and indentured servants from the most agrarian societies of West Africa and Europe. I don't know if servility is due mostly to genetic inheritance, to cultural background, or to slave school training. Most likely it is an interaction of all three. But I don't believe that any amount of education, propagandizing, will change the attitudes, values, and intelligence of most adults. Nor do I believe that the majority can be manipulated into a free society by some elite of would-be philosopher kings. Such an effort will, at most, only change the rulers. So long as most people can be easily manipulated, they will be manipulated for the aggrandizement of the manipulators. Traditional agriculture is on the way out. At the moment, quite a number of people are playing return to yield homestead games, but few are producing enough food to even feed themselves. Barring a catastrophe of sufficient magnitude to destroy technology worldwide, I predict that within a few decades there will be inexpensive, lightweight, mostly automated biochemical devices capable of converting most organic compounds into most other organic compounds. Load the hopper with dead leaves or sawdust, insert the proper program, wait a few days, and out comes food wafers which are at least as nutritious and tasty as most of the stuff sold in supermarkets today. Insert different programs and out comes various plastics for construction and clothing. Of course, this is just one approach. Maybe I will modify my digestive tract to convert cellulose to sugar. Maybe I will develop hardier varieties of traditional food plants able to grow wild with little assistance as well as more palatable varieties of wild plants. For the immediate future, maybe many grow holes are the way. In any case, I don't think that farming is the wave of the future. With the decline of agriculture, servility loses survival value. Improving communication has the same effect. People will no longer need to crowd into cities or be visible anywhere to work and play together. Consider the potentialities of pseudo-random noise radio transmission. Coded transmission detectable only with matching receivers. Even that institution run amok, the contemporary state, has this effect. It is its most gullible and easily invaded subjects who are most likely to be killed in its wars. So I think in the long run, people who place a high value on personal small group sovereignty will become a larger proportion of the human population. Vanu, while difficult, is easier now than it has been since the Neolithic period, perhaps as high as 1 or 2% of the population, through accidents of heredity and environment, have values and abilities sufficient to achieve it. To become Vanu, we must disentangle ourselves from those who can't or won't achieve it. Reject all reform society as a whole schemes, put aside utopian dreams of worldwide free societies, and get with ourselves and each other. Build our vanums and vanuist mini-cultures. Possibly, I underestimate the potential of existing humans. Possibly, most people do value vanu and can't achieve it. If so, we are more apt to help them become free by becoming free ourselves and then showing the way, rather than by joining political crusades. Political reform, revolution, re-education has been attempted thousands of times in hundreds of situations over hundreds of centuries, but at most changes only faces and slogans. Any sort of political movement becomes a contest at coercion and manipulation. Past crusades failed not because of impure motives, betrayal, or defects in philosophy. Why is it invariably defects, not the good elements which come to predominate? But because of their very nature. Function determines form, means determine ends. The very programs of the state most attested by present reformers are reforms gone to seeds of past crusaders. Dr. G and I did not choose our way of life primarily because we expect a nuclear war or other apocalypse within a few years. What we have considered possibilities of various catastrophes in our planning, if nuclear weapons have never been invented, we would probably be living much the same way, perhaps somewhat closer to large cities. Institutionalized coercion, states, is a long-existing social phenomenon. War is only its most dramatic form of destruction. We are striving to reduce vulnerability to all forms of coercion and maximize all satisfactions. Dr. G and I would like to contact more people with similar ideas, attitudes, and actions. If you are not in the region, we invite letters. If you are in the region, let's arrange joint drops at least, maybe meet occasionally. I think the Loose Open Association, as Lan has named it, is the best community model, at least at first. Any closer involvement should come only as people get to know each other over an extended time. We are now able to provide someone with a food stash, shelter, and equipment adequate most of the time from May through October. This would be already set up in an attractive, secluded spot, several miles at least from any habitation including other Vanuans known to us. We can bring supplies and mail occasionally once a month to someone who wants to remain completely out of that society for a while. By next autumn, we may be able to provide year-round shelter. Our prices are low, or we will barter for services products we want. Of course, don't come to Siskiyou because a few Vanuans are already there. Hoped for relations might not work out. Come only if, like us, you evaluate the region as optimum for you. From Vanu Life Number 9, September 1972. Editor's Note. See the introduction to adjust the prices mentioned here for inflation. 
Epilogue. The Disappearance. If you want to get in touch with Rayo after reading the preceding chapters, I'm sorry to say that I can't help you. Rayo disappeared in 1974. I don't even know whether he is now dead or alive. We can only speculate about what might have happened to him. Perhaps one of his underground constructions fell in on him, or maybe he was eaten by a bear. Or he could have abandoned Vonu and returned to a conventional lifestyle, or maybe he moved overseas. Or perhaps he just decided that he would be freer if he broke off communication and he is still out there in the mountains, living free. If it were anyone else, I would guess that this complete silence over so many years must mean that he is dead. But Rayo is different because his goal always was to become invisible to coercers, meaning mainly government. He might have come to believe that this required that he become invisible to everyone. I know of only one tantalizing clue that has a bearing on this mystery. Rayo's last known letter. This is dated February 14, 1974. In it, he writes to his correspondent, quote, My thinking has undergone major changes in the last several months on interfacing, alternate economics, interrelations in general. I, too, am becoming very dubious as to the value of all libertarian club involvements. We do not intend to use the libertarian club in the future as an avenue for gaining non-anonymous friends or associates, end quote. Since that time, from or concerning Rayo, no one I know has heard one word, or the least rumor. He has completely disappeared. Transcribers Afterward Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged was more important than most realize. It fomented a cultural evolution away from authoritarianism and provided the first, albeit fictional, version of a different, free society. This is what motivated Rayo and others to begin creating their own freedom outside of the statist, servile society. They decided to go Galt in a very real and practical way. Vanu, as defined by Rayo, is a contraction of voluntary and not vulnerable. The early privacy advocates were looking for solutions on how to prevent the government from unjustly profiling them in an attempt to chill their dissent against the surveillance police state apparatus. The solution was Vanu. Although Vanu is much more expansive than the disappearance, as I initially thought. Depending on your lifestyle or life situation, the particular way you Vanu can vary. For example, you may have some interaction with the status survival society through driver's licenses and unavoidable taxation, etc. Rayo's articles were certainly important and intriguing, but it's important to keep in mind that they were written from the early 1960s to the late 1970s. Some information found in this book may not be applicable in current times, such as the food prices and the increasing invasiveness of Big Brother. The latter can make it more difficult for one to actually disappear. That and the technology available to the state, such as dragnet wiretapping and data mining, is far more advanced to the point I'm not actually sure if it's possible to disappear completely. Yet, I haven't tried it myself. At least not yet. One of the most intriguing aspects of this book was the variety of lifestyles Rayo touched upon. RV living, living on the water, and tent camping. He provided extensive detail on his experiences, what was successful and unsuccessful, as well as the now outdated cost. Again, it's worth mentioning that the efficacy of these three strategies at this time are unknown. Alex Ansari documented his experiences in RV living over the past year, 2015 to 2016, which gives us some insight, but also introduces new problems such as nuisance abatement. As far as the other two, I'm unfamiliar of anyone testing out and documenting their experiences. That said, Rail and his colleagues have surely provided us with more options in finding more freedom in our own lives, right now. Though practice was not the only thing touched upon in this book, he also discussed the theory behind it and raised some concerns within libertarian circles during his own time. This book also provided one of the earliest critiques of reformism, and as such predates Kyle Reardon's anthology and Elusive Phantom of Hope, a critique of reformism, by 33 years. Two new words to identify political libertarianism are mentioned as well. Political crusading and bullshit libertarianism, obviously derisive in meaning. To summate this section, he also discusses the failed educational campaigns of the past and expresses hopelessness in such efforts in the future, as he didn't see them bringing about any real freedom. That is similar to Libertander Attack's focus, as we are strictly trying to reach those who have already seen through the fog with our direct action series and the Freedom Umbrella of Direct Action. Summarily, there is an interesting overlap between the security culture concept and Vanu. All Vanuans, practitioners of Vanu, must already practice security culture, but not all those who practice security culture must also be Vanuans. 
Vanu is a strategy specifically for libertarians and anarchists, whereas security culture is for anyone that cares about their privacy, regardless of ideological adherence. It is sincerely my hope that you have enjoyed learning from Rayo's book, as it is an indispensable milestone within libertarian history. Shane Radliff, Bloomington, Illinois. You've just heard Bonnie, The Search for Personal Freedom by Rayo, narrated to you by Shane Radler from Liberty Under Attack Publications, and Kyle Reardon from The Last Bastille Blog. To purchase the paperback, to check out our full catalog, or to view our selection of privacy tools, please visit libertyunderattack.com. Again libertyunderattack.com. Thanks for listening, and cheers from the Free Republic.